Good morning, folks. Uh, my name's Alan Croft. By way of a short intro, I worked at Oak Ridge National Lab for 30 years, uh, at which time they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, so I retired. I, I failed it miserably, so here I am. So with that, I have to have some boilerplate. What I'm going to talk about is first neutron interactions with matter and reactor control as a backdrop for then talking about nuclear reactors and then to go on and talk about nuclear fuels, fresh and spent. Uh, a couple of uh, overview points. Uh, I'm going to be largely descriptive because there's a lot of territory to cover and, and so I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to try to avoid theory and try to make it a little bit more intuitive and see if that works. Secondly, you'll see in some of the material I'm going to present this afternoon, I'll go through a bunch of slides and then there's backup material. And this is basically, I had to fit, fit 10 gallons in a five gallon bucket. And so these are basically other reactor concepts, some of the more obscure ones that just didn't fit. I leave the material for you to look at. And if there's a point of interest, maybe we can do something offline here in the next couple of days. First, interactions of the neutrons with matter. First, need to talk about the concept of a cross-section, which is the probability that a neutron will interact with a nucleus. It's measured in square centimeters, denoted by a lowercase sigma. Most cross-sections are on the order of 10 to the minus 24th square centimeters, very small, range plus or minus 100. And to early researchers, despite that magnitude, it was unexpectedly large and as big as a barn, and so that name is stuck. The unit of 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters is a barn. Uh, the cross-section is not the measurement of the physical, physical cross-section of a nucleus. It's more the, a measure of how stable the nucleus is relative to a nucleus that interacted with, the neutron, with a neutron. And, and so it's, it's more of a, uh, I, I, I can't call it thermodynamic, but that, that kind of a concept. Uh, how stable is one situation versus another. Then a reaction rate, uh, a macroscopic cross-section is a microscopic cross-section for a particular nucleus multiplied by the number density of that nucleus, denoted by a capital sigma. sigma. Uh, and when you multiply that by a neutron flux, which is what we're talking about here, neutrons, you get an interaction rate. And interactions might be fissions or captures or something like this. And I'll talk about that a little bit more here in, in just a second. Neutron flux is the total path length covered by all neutrons going in all directions in a unit volume, usually a, a cubic centimeter. And it's a little bit different than I'd call it the engineering definition of flux, whereas, for example, the, the flux of water going through a pipe is just the gallons of water going through a, a, a surface area. In this case, the neutrons are going in all sorts of different directions with all sorts of different velocities, and so you have to take all that into account irrespective of what the direction is. Some other definitions uh, many of you may know. Fissile means a nuclide that can support a self-sustaining nuclear reaction. And there are some really obscure ones, but the four you see here are the most common. And as has been said, uh, U-235 is the only one that occurs naturally. Uh, others in small amounts, some curium isotopes and this kind of thing do exist. Fissionable or fissible, the latter is not used very common, which is a nuclide that can fission, but it can't su support a self-sustaining nuclear reaction, uranium-238 being by far the most common example. Uh, and, but it's virtually any actinide given a high enough energy neutron. Fertile is a nuclide that can be converted into a fissile material. And the ones most often thought about are U-238, which leads to plutonium, uh, plutonium-240 leading to plutonium-241, and thorium-232, which is the 
sort of alternate fuel cycle not uh, really being pursued very seriously that leads to U-233 as the vessel material. Now the concept of a chain reaction, we start, uh, start up here with a U-235 and a neutron magically appears, hits the U-235 nucleus and it fissions and you get a couple of fission products and you get about three neutrons. The number is more like 2.7, but you get three neutrons. And some different things can happen to these neutrons. Uh, there's a possibility that a neutron can hit another U-235 atom and cause another fission. There's a possibility the neutron over here just goes on out to oblivion, doesn't hit much of anything, do anything useful. Or the neutron can be captured by U-238 or other materials for that matter and uh, lead to other radioisotopes. If you get everything balanced properly, this, this reaction becomes self-sustaining, meaning you produce just enough, the right number of neutrons, leading hitting another U-235 and so on. So you're, you're in level flight in terms of a chain reaction. It's not ramping up, it's not ramping down called a self-sustaining nuclear reaction, which is, of course, the kind of thing you want in a nuclear reactor. Uh, to elaborate on the fission process a bit, the neutron comes in, all sorts of radiation comes flying out of here, you get two fission, fission, fission fragments, easy for me to say, and you get, and these fission fragments start off normally with a very short-lived isotope of a certain mass number, and here the mass numbers are 90 and, and 143. And they decay down typically to longer and longer and longer lived isotopes. Eventually you get to something that's stable over here, and the, ma the, uh, uh, the mass number of these doesn't change, but the atomic number does change, typically through a series of, of beta decays, uh, 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 decaying by kicking out an, an electron. And uh, usually gamma rays accompany that also. And this is the fission product yield curve. And each fission will produce generally one fission product from underneath this hump someplace and one from underneath here. And of course, the mass for U-235 fission must total 236, the 235 plus the neutron you added to it. But you can, you can get them uh, on, on both sides of the hump and with, with uh, the maximum probabilities being roughly 90 and 143, as you saw in the previous one. Uh, there is a small amount of so-called ternary fission that occurs, and that's when a fission produces three fission products. The third fission product will generally be very, very light. It will be uh, hydrogen, tritium, uh, uh, helium, nucleus, something like this. Uh, the, the amount of such fissions is, is very low, it's, it's, it's down in, in, in this level and probably wouldn't be uh, noticed at all except that the tritium is a little bit of a nuisance and it's a not insignificant source of tritium in spent fuel. So that's why uh, we've paid a little bit of attention to it in years past. Now, binding energy. Uh, the mass of the, the nucleus is composed of a mess of protons and neutrons, depending on which you're talking about, and the mass of the nucleus is less than the sum of the masses of the free particles. And the difference is the energy that holds the nucleus together. It's called the binding energy. Fission products, uh, fission produces fission products and neutrons that have less total binding energy, meaning energy is released, and what you get is this is basically Einstein's equation. You get this change in mass gets converted to energy, and that's the energy from fission. That's what you're after in a nuclear reactor, but it results from the change in the, uh, in the binding energy. And this is uh, a listing of the energy per fission, and it comes out most of it is fission product kinetic energy. The fission products are very massive. They're charged particles, so they go just about nowhere, you know, far less than a centimeter. And the energy comes out as heat. 
But then you see other, you've got neutrons and instantaneous gammas and all sorts of other things. And the net is uh, about 200, roughly, MeV per fission is, is what is released. It varies a little bit depending on the actinide. The heavier the actinide fissioning, it goes up a little bit, maybe approaching 210. But it's, it's in that range for anything that's uh, important. Now I want to start, call, I talked about the fission reaction a little bit. I want to start talking a little bit about some other neutron reactions. First, neutron capture, which is the addition of one neutron to the target nucleus without fission. Uh, and it can be parasitic or productive. Uh, here in the lower left is a parasitic. A neutron goes into some uh, nuclide, um, you know, pick cesium-137 and you get a compound nucleus which is sort of excited and uh, it, it stabilizes and you get a beta particle which is a negative electron given off as radiation and then maybe some gamma rays. Uh, and you end up with cesium-138 in this case. Uh, a more productive one is the neutron into U-238 which after a couple of beta decays for, through relatively short-lived materials you end up with plutonium-239, which is a useful fissile material in, in, in a reactor. We can also have other kinds of neutron captures uh, other than just kicking out a gamma ray. You can uh, put a neutron in and you can get two or three or, in theory, even four neutrons come back out. You can get charged particles out. You can put a neutron in and get a proton out neutron alpha. These are lower, normally lower probability than, than N gamma reactions, but they're not inconsequential by a long shot. Uh, most of these reactions tend to require higher energy neutrons and have relatively small cross sections. Uh, and there's an exception when cap the capture project is magic, and I'll explain about magic a little bit later on. I have, I have a diagram, but... <laughs> uh, and uh, a notational thing, an absorption cross-section is the sum of all the neutron capture and fission reactions. Uh, is the high-energy neutron the same as the fast neutron that was mentioned earlier? Question, is the high-energy neutron the same as the fast neutron? Yes. And we'll get that to that also. <laughs> uh, all right, this big diagram up here is the so-called chart of the nuclides. Uh, the number of neutrons in a nucleus, uh, horizontal. The number of uh, protons go vertical. In nuclear reactors and what we deal with, well, uh, one other point, you see these sort of light-colored things sort of going up on the <laughs> diagonal. Those are stable isotopes. And in the nuclear reactor business, we deal with the stuff stable and below stable essentially nothing up here which are neutron deficient nuclides and they're, when you're dealing in a neutron system you just can't get up there. Uh, you make those in, in accelerators. Uh, this, if you look at the whole thing, it's like a three by four chart on the wall. Uh, it's useful for figuring out what makes what and uh, down here in the lower left you see a little key for various kinds of radioactive decay. If you have a parent in an alpha emission you end up down here, uh, neutron emission, uh, negatron decay or beta decay goes to the upper left. Up in here, these are particle reactions. In other words, assuming the nucleus is hit by a particular kind of a particle, whether it be a neutron, alpha particle, proton, gives you the direction and, and where you end up. And you'll see a couple of other incarnations of this as we go on. I uh, want to talk about neutrons and neutron speed and energy and temperature uh, and because neutrons and, and people who deal with, oh rats, <laughs> I pulled the wrong trigger, back one, uh, people who deal with reactors use these sometimes interchangeably. But in the, uh, in the first bullet up here, I've assumed we have a neutron going at 2200 meters per second and I picked that with malice of forethought. And uh, with a, just a, a simple conversion, uh, you end up with 
the, uh, uh, the energy of the neutron in terms of joules. Now you can take that and just do another conversion and you get it in terms of electron volts. And then you can take the joules and use something called the Boltzmann constant and you can get the equivalent temperature of, of the neutron. And neutrons are, this, this confuses people, uh, I think, a lot of the time, but we often refer to the neutrons in terms of their temperature. Normally, paradoxically, we don't have hot neutrons, but we have cold neutrons and we have, you see here, thermal neutrons. And we'll talk quite a bit about thermal neutrons as we go in. But the thermal neutron means essentially the, the neutron energy is in equilibrium at the temperature, its surrounding temperature is, is a simple way to think of it. Now, with the concept of energy, neutron energy, this is a, a sort of a typical neutron spectrum in, in a reactor. And by spectrum, it's the number of neutrons on the vertical axis as a function of ener neutron energy on the horizontal axis. Now, I, I like this diagram because it, uh, well, it, it gets fairly clear and illustrates a number of concepts. But the funny thing you got to note about it is the energy scale is reversed. High energy is here and low energy is down here. And I'm not sure what point the originator was trying to make, but it's sort of backwards. So what you've got here is basically this ragged looking peak is the fission spectrum. When U-235 or plutonium-239 fission, it gives off a distribution of neutrons that looks something like this. And then as the neutrons sort of interact with matter, uh, they, they rattle around, around a little bit and they start losing energy in, in their surrounding environment. And then you end up with this peak down here. And this peak is roughly equivalent to room temperature, equivalent to 0 0.25 electron volts. And this is sort of a Maxwellian distribution, a distri distribution, uh, statistical distribution around the, the, the uh, existing temperature. And uh, the, the maximum energy up here is on the order of 10 or 15 million electron volts. So there's a, there's a huge range of uh, neutron energies. Now, to turn to cross sections, which is where the neutrons are interacting, this diagram is, is done right with high energy on the right. And these are the fission cross sections for plutonium-239 and U-235. And you see a number of, 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 of features here. First, the cross sections are essentially at a maximum at very low neutron energies and drop down, if, if you ignore all the, the clutter here, it's, it's about a 1 over V, 1 over the neutron velocity kind of a shape. And this is generically the case for uh, most cross sections. And there, there is a different, well, for most cross sections. Uh, in the middle area here, you see a, a resonance region where you see all these bumps. Uh, at certain energies, uh, there's a much higher probability that the neutron will interact with the nucleus, so you get this spike in, in the cross-section value. And this is, again, very typical of, of most nuclides. And then up in the fast area, it, it uh, just high energy area, it just tends to sort of tail off like the roughly 1 over V. Now, I said most have this shape. You see an exception over here. This is uranium-238 vision cross-section. Remember, it's not... Uh, it's not fissile, but it will fission if you get a sufficiently high, uh, high energy neutron. And it looks like it takes off, what's that, about 1 MeV over there. Uh, you start to be getting fissions in U-238. And uh, a little bit more on the resonances uh, is a resonance is, is a big spike in cross-section, but if you imagine sort of a uniform energy distribution of neutrons, at the energy of the resonance, the, the resonance is so big, it just sucks up all the neutrons at that energy and could suck up more if there were neutrons at that energy. What that has the effect of doing is it reduces the size of the resonance, this dip in the flux, which is the dashed line. The, the effective size of the resonance is, is lower. Uh, not its actual measured value, but you have to treat it like that. Um, 
and uh, that can occur either because the resonance is fairly large or you can just have a lot of a particular nuclide in a reactor and the one case you might imagine is uranium-238 where 95 percent of your fuel or something like that is U-238 so even though its resonances may not be monstrous you tend to get this kind of an effect. Second thing is Doppler broadening. Uh, resonance data is measured at room temperature conventionally. Reactors operate at a higher temperature uh, depending on, on what you're doing and as you get to the higher temperature the resonance begins to get shorter and, and, and wider and it's sort of like the what is the Hubble redshift kind of a thing. Uh, the, the, it's some, something's moving, the, the wavelength of light gets, gets longer and these things get broader. And so the net effect of this is to increase the size of the resonance. And I'll make that a little bit more relevant uh, here in a bit. Now I want to talk about uh, a, a neutron interaction uh, that doesn't result in any kind of a capture, scattering. Uh, and there are two kinds of scattering. There's elastic scattering. This is the billiard ball model where you've got a neutron coming in with some, uh, some energy it hits a target nucleus and the target nucleus goes one way and the neutron goes another but the energy of the uh, oh rats take me back again trying to use this pointer is proving to be a challenge uh, the incident energy of the neutron is conserved over here in other words the sum of these two energies is this incident neutron energy whereas in inelastic scattering the neutron interacts with the nucleus and the nucleus moves off with, with some energy and the neutron does with some energy but it gets the nucleus a little bit excited and it, it kicks out it says it's a quantum, it's, it's, it's a gamma ray, it's a photon and so you end up with these uh, capture gammas uh, being emitted and both processes go on in nuclear reactors and those processes are important because of neutron moderation. Uh, in a reactor, you know, there, there's a, a complication. For many reactors, uh, you want the cross-section to be as large as possible. If you remember from the cross-section graph, that occurs when neutron energies are low. And you want it that way because if the cross-section is large, you don't need as much nuclear material in the reactor to make it go. Uh, the issue is neutrons are born with energies of many MeV and you want to slow them down to energies of EV and the process of doing so is called neutron moderation and it occurs by scattering off moderator nuclei through elastic and inelastic processes. Uh, the criteria for a good moderator is it maximizes neutron scattering and minimizes non-productive neutron capture and probably should list, should have a, a significant density, have a, be able to get a lot of it in one space. Uh, the maximum neutron energy loss per, per collision is proportional to this little uh, uh, term I've written up here, which is at a maximum when uh, the atomic number is one, which is hydrogen, and that thing is zero, uh, and then it drops, uh, I'm sorry, it's one, and then drops to 0.28 for uh, 12 which is carbon and that pretty much spans with, between those two elements you, you see all the moderators that have been considered uh, and these are the uh, those that well people have, have taken halfway seriously water very popular heavy water is used uh, good moderating ratio and I should say this moderating ratio is not that little term on the previous slide this moderating ratio takes into account the capture cross sections and the bad stuff also. So water has a significant capture cross section even though it has great moderation so it's a little bit low. Heavy water not quite as good but its cross section is about zip so it has a very high number. Uh, helium is very low and the problem there is its density. At one atmosphere, there are just not enough atoms in any volume, so you can do yourself any good. Even if you took it to 100 atmospheres or something like that, it's still a very low number. So helium, even though it's used in reactors, doesn't moderate much of anything. 
Uh, beryllium's been used in some test reactors, and uh, graphite has been used in, in a number of reactors and may see more use in, in the future. Now I sort of want to take all this and talk about reactor criticality and then reactor control. Uh, a thermal reactor, uh, you've heard them talked about uh, here already, it's a reactor in which the neutrons are moderated down to thermal energies, down to the EV range, and most fissions are caused by these thermal neutrons, not by higher energy neutrons. And the definition here again, neutron and thermal equilibrium, which is the Maxwellian distribution at the temperature of their environment. Now I want to talk a little bit about this. This is sort of the, uh, the, the life of a thousand neutrons in a thermal reactor. That's what this uh, chart gets to if I cannot push, avoid pushing the wrong button. And so we're going to start up here with a thousand neutrons. Well, the first thing in this reactor is we, there's, a, there's some probability U238 is going to fission from, from the fast neutrons. And that's, that's about 4% or something. So you gain yourself 44 neutrons. But then the fast neutrons, they're whizzing all around, and your reactor is, is, has a finite size. I mean, it's got tops and a side. And some of the neutrons go out, and they just keep on going uh, and don't interact inside the reactor again. So you just lose them. So you lose 145 there. And then when you get into this resonance, which is also called epithermal range, uh, you lose some more there, about 43. And the resonance in the resonance range, neutron captures in U238 starts to become important. And while that will eventually produce plutonium that becomes part of your fuel, for the purpose of keeping the reactor going, they're, they're just lost to the, to the system. So you lose another 157 there, and ep some epithermal neutrons get lost in non-fuel material, like the cladding in there, or get captured in water. And so you lose a, a few more. Uh, but then you gain something, because there are some epithermal fissions in U-235. Uh, and then coming down to the thermal neutrons, uh, some thermal neutrons can leak out of the reactor, and some th thermal neutrons are absorbed in the fuel, uh, but not productively. In other words, U-235 captures neutrons to make U-236, not to fission. And so you lose some there. And I mentioned the, the, the temperature effect, uh, and there's a little bit less absorption in there uh, because of the fuel temperature is, is a bit elevated, and you get expansion of the, co of the core. And so its, it's dimensions change just a tad. But then U-235, eventually it comes down to it captures the neutron, and you get the roughly 2.7 neutrons, uh, well, 1.79 net. 2.79 come out, but you've captured one to make it fission. And so you get 441 back, so you're at 1,000 again. And that's your chain reaction, and that's sort of where, you know, I mean, neutrons are going and coming and this kind of thing. Uh, you'll see over on the far right a lot of uh, obscure Greek letters and other letters and this kind of thing. Back in the old days, before when, when we used slide rules and this kind of stuff, it didn't have computers. If you multiply all of these various factors together, you'll find that it equals one. And, and uh, e each one of these factors is associated with this, uh, this notation. And they used this equation and then went out and measured these various parameters to predict what they needed to do to get a reactor to go critical and have a self-sustaining reaction. It's, uh, and and the, the product of all these is called uh, K-effective, K-sub-effective, and it's just the, uh, and, and it's the uh, multiplication factor uh, back in the old days. But uh, it, it helps, I, I hope, give an intuitive feel for what's going on inside this reactor. Uh, now, getting to critical, uh, you want to build yourself a reactor, what, what do you do to make sure it go, goes critical? It's, it's not a real easy thing to do. Uh, first, you can increase the concentration of fissile material within limits, but you can do that. Secondly, you can decrease parasitic neutron absorption. You select materials with low cross-sections, 
and you just simply put less material in the reactor. You know, you keep the, the materials as thin as possible uh, and, and keep so uh, you, you, don't, uh, uh, you don't lose the neutrons in non-productive captures and you reduce neutron leakage. Neutrons leak from reactor surfaces. The bigger a reactor core gets, the lower the surface to volume ratio and the lower the fraction of neutrons leaked. So those are the basic principles used, uh, used in, uh, in uh, design to, to getting to critical. Uh, and I, I note this, uh, this is just a simple conversion uh, to get the power in watts, starting with a fission cross section, the mass of fissile material, and the neutron flux, you just multiply that out. Uh, because I wanted to use that uh, here in a couple of seconds. Now I want to move on to reactor control. Uh, I'll, I'll describe reactors later on, but at this point I sort of want to talk about, okay, how, how, do, we, how do we keep this beast in, in, in control and not have it go crazy on us? Uh, each fission releases two and a half to three fast neutrons within a very short time. A, a fission is a very quick event. Uh, the time from one generation of proton neutrons to the next in a thermal reactor, and that is the time it takes the neutron to rattle through that uh, number chart that I showed you, is on the order of 10 milliseconds. Now a, a concept, a, a stable period, is the time it takes to increase the neutron flux and according to that equation you saw in the previous slide, the reactor power by a factor of E, which is a factor of 2.7. Uh, for prompt neutrons, which are the neutrons released immediately, did it again, <clears throat> released immediately in fission, the stable period is, is a fraction of a second, very short amount of time. With that kind of a power increase in, in, in a fraction of a second, the, the reactor is un uncontrollable. The control rods or, or other control mechanisms you had can't move fast enough to con control something that's, that can move left or right in a fraction of a second. So you got a real problem here. However, there are these things called delayed neutrons. Uh, a, a, a fraction of fission products, and the fission products resulting from fission of U-235 or plutonium-239, decay by emitting neutrons instead of beta particles. Uh, these neutrons are emitted at a somewhat lower energy than the fission spectrum, but they're emitted with, at, a, with a, at a defined half-life. In other words, it's not just a fission event. It's like the decay of cesium or strontium or whatever. It has a, a measurable and, and, and defined half-life that is on the order, there's different ones, but on the order of seconds to tens of seconds normally. Uh, and they're, uh, they're uh, these neutrons are emitted along the so-called neutron drip line, and I'll talk about that in just a second. The existence of these decay neutrons with their much longer life, when you average it all out, takes the stable period up into the range of seconds, and basically that's what allows the reactor to be controlled. If it weren't for those uh, delayed neutrons, we wouldn't have nuclear reactors. All we would have is nuclear weapons. Now, we're back to our chart again, uh, and this is the neutron drip line up here. Uh, fission products are being produced, and you saw the, uh, I showed you the, the chains before, like the, the 90 chain and the 143, and they're decaying up in this direction. When you get beyond this ragged red line, uh, lower than that, that's where these neutrons, uh, these neutron emitters, delayed neutron emitters occur, and basically, some of the fissions produce fission products that have so many neutrons, it, 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 you know, the neutrons just sort of fall out of them. It, it, it doesn't get a chance to go through the beta decay process. Uh, the one other thing I wanted to point out here uh, is we get to magic. And you see these green bars, of course, and, and of course this is uh, the number of protons going up this way and this is the uh, uh, number of neutrons. At certain numbers, of protons or neutrons, the nucleus is much more stable than to the left and to the right of it. And it's, it's much like in, in chemistry. You've got your chemical elements and in, you know, in, in one place you've got hydrogen, you get just a little bit of it, put a match in and, and poof, it chemically reacts, it burns. 
Next over is helium, which is right here, and it's totally stable. You can't, well, you can get it to react with something, but under such extreme conditions, it doesn't make any sense. And, that, and that's because the, you have a, a closed, in, in this case, shell of electrons in a chemical sense. The magic numbers are the same thing in the nuclear sense. You have nucleons, your protons and neutrons, and certain numbers of them make a very stable configuration, and so those nuclides tend to be stable, and nuclides near them tend to undergo neutron reactions that make them, because it, you know, it goes to the more stable product. And so in, in some funny places down here, you, you'll see some very uh, high cross sections for NP reactions, because it happens to make something that's, uh, that has a magic number. All right. Uh, now, nuclear reactor control, uh, the way you control a reactor is a neutron poison. It's a not, you know, which undergoes non-productive neutron captures. It just sucks up a neutron and doesn't lead to anything beneficial. May I, probably better call it a fission poison, but the, the term used is a neutron poison. And basically, you, you, know, you, you design your reactor so as you lower the amount of neutron poison in there, at some point, it becomes critical. You lower it that much more, and the reactor starts to increase power. And you lower it just enough so it's increasing power based on the delayed neutrons. If they weren't there, the thing would, would just not increase power. And so you, you start increasing the power uh, and you keep going up and up until you're at whatever power level you want out of the reactor. Then you put just a little bit more poison back and you get into this level of flight where you've got a self-sustaining chain reaction at some power level. And so that's, that's the, uh, the overlying concept. The neutron poisons that are often used, boron, silver, cadmium, indium, Samarium, europium, and, and gadolinium. Uh, these, uh, let's see, these right in here are used in material, uh, let me call it engineered materials, but they're also produced as fission products. And so you need to take that into account. But when you're controlling a reactor, you, you put these in some kind of an engineered form. And when we get into the reactors, I'll talk a little bit more about what those forms are. Um, there are also some in inherent control mechanism, mechanisms. Uh, increased temperature normally decreases neutron interaction and can take you subcritical uh, because of Doppler broadening, meaning you suck up more neutrons and non-productive neutron captures uh, in U-238 normally, which is the, the big gorilla in a reactor, as you might imagine. And as I said before, the reactor core expands a bit, more surface area, and you're, you're dealing with, with narrow margins here. Also, uh, in, in reactors where it's relevant, uh, if the coolant boils, uh, you have less moderator in there. The neutrons are then at higher energy, and the cross sections are smaller. So that tends to decrease it. So there are some useful feedback effects to keep reactors from you know, sort of going crazy on you, at least thermal reactors. Uh, now, reactor physics calculations. Reactor physics, science of interaction of elementary particles and radiations characteristic of nuclear reactors. Uh, and what reactor physics basically, basically does is take some of what I've just talked about and actually be able to, uh, to calculate how a reactor will behave uh, and, and to design a reactor. And uh, like I said, in, in the old days, the reactor physics was basically the uh, infinite or, and, and the uh, effective multiplication factor. I mean, it was done using those things in little you know, tables and numbers and measurements. These days, everything, of course, is computers and calculations like that. Uh, what do we need to know? And I'm going to focus mostly on the neutrons here, since that's what makes a reactor go. You need to know the neutron flux in and around a reactor core and the reactions of the neutrons and in the fuel and the structural materials, to some extent other radiation, but most of the other radiation isn't very important. It's mostly the neutrons, but as a function of space, energy, direction, and time. Um, and 
fellow named Boltzmann develop an equation that does just that. It describes the transport of neutral particles, meaning it won't work for protons or alpha particles or anything like that, but gamma rays and neutrons, that's what the equation is for. And this is the Boltzmann equation. It's, uh, it's hairy, and there, there's some explanation of it for, <laughs> for anybody that's a fan. And I, I just wanted to put it up. There, there, there will not be a test. Uh, there there is, is a problem with the Boltzmann equation, uh, other than it's complicated. But the, the, the problem is it can't be solved in closed form. In other words, you can't do all those integrals and stuff and, and get an equation you can just plug some numbers into and calculate the flux as a function of, of all these things. It's just, there are just equations like that. You can't do it in closed form. Uh, so what you do is you approximate. And the first thing you do is you take your cross sections, uh, and this is, what have I got, U230, U235 vision? No, total, I guess it is. But the cross section itself is this smooth curve, and you can see a couple of res resonances. And you do what's called discretize, discretize it. Meaning, instead of having a continuous function, you break it into a cross section at this energy and another value at this energy, so you can imagine the table with those number pairs. Okay, I didn't even know I hit a button that time, but anyway. Uh, you do, you know, you you do this with all of your cross sections. That's that's sort of the beginning of this process. Then you're faced with with another. <laughs> wasn't even touching it. Uh, thank. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, then there's another complication presents itself. Uh, a, in, in a nuclear reactor, uh, I think enough of you know enough about nuclear reactors at this point is they're, they're not a homogeneous medium. They've got, they've got rods and they got water over here and they got edges to them and the rods they have cladding and fuel and tops and bottoms and so there's a, a heterogeneity, heterogeneity in there that causes a lot of problems in solving the, the equation and when you couple that with needing to know where the flux is at all these points and as a, as a, and that all those energies that, the, that you saw in the multi-group cross-section and over as time goes through, you end up with the number of points in the billions, which is still way beyond current computing power. Uh, just, there's just too many data points. So you do, you sort of bite it off you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Uh, you start with a single fuel rod uh, indicated up here, which is, and it, it's, in, it's, it's in a little cell, and it's a little round rod, and there's some cladding on the outside, and some fuel material in there, and then there's water. And you use numerical methods, uh, either so-called transport methods or Monte Carlo methods, along with the moldy groups cross sections for the various radionuclides uh, to calculate what's called a many group neutron flux. And many group might be 50, 75 energy groups, something like that. You saw the U-235 and all the little groups in it. It's on the order of that number and, and there's no universally used number. It, it varies. And you, you calculate the neutron flux in this little cell uh, as a function of en energy for those groups. Uh, it's a static calculation, meaning you're not trying to go through time and see what changes happen. Uh, you're doing it in two dimensions. You don't account for the length of the rod. And you have only key radionuclides, your U-235, 238, some of the cladding things, and maybe a few what are called lump fission products. In other words, they'll create some artificial radionuclide that has a cross-section representative of a class of uh, real fission products. Uh, and so you, you'll have maybe five or ten or something of those. And you run these calculations for a, a number of fuel compositions. So now you've got a flux for this little, this little cell, and you start to build on it. Uh, these days, they're, they're, 
it is possible that you may be able to simulate some uh, some subsection of a fuel assembly. This is meant to represent uh, bunches of rods with uh, symmetry boundaries here. And we're getting to the point where you may be able to do those transporter Monte Carlo calculations for something on this order where these different pins might not have the same composition and then calculate a flux representative of this chunk. Uh, but it's still mostly done using the, the one in the previous, the simpler one, which is called a pin cell. Then you start to grow from there. You start to put the pin cells in arrays, and these, each of these may have a different, well, they will have a different uh, uh, flux associated with them, a different flux uh, neutron spectrum. And what you do is, you use the neutron spectrum in each of these to weight the cross sections and go from 75 or 50 energy groups down to two to five group energy groups for each of these. But in, the, in, in this calculation, again using transporter Monte Carlo methods, you represent this, this entire assembly, that this would be a fuel assembly with, with all these rods. And then you go from there, and once you calculate a neutron spectrum from that, you go and you, you homogenize the entire assembly. So you end up with a, a neutron spectrum uh, and cross sections relevant to a homogenized assembly that does not have uh, the, the rods represented. Uh, and all, all the time what you're doing is, is on, on one hand, your, your, your dimensions are going up, but on the other hand, your number of energy groups are going down, so, you, so the problem remains tractable. And then the next thing is you take those cross-section sets for various assemblies at various, you know, various places in a reactor core, uh, and the assemblies would have different compositions, and you do a three-dimensional model of the entire core, and this now becomes time-dependent you look at how the composition and the flux and everything changes over time as a, as a reactor would be operate, operating. Relatively few energy groups, no, mo no more than five and, and sometimes less, relatively coarse grid because you're, you're representing it on, on an assembly by assembly basis uh, and you go through it stepwise with, with depletion. You count for the changes in uh, radionuclide composition and what effect they have on the flux. But in this situation, you've sufficiently homogenized it, so you don't need to use transporter Monte Carlo, which are very computer-intensive things, especially Monte Carlo. And there's uh, another approach, uh, simplification, called diffusion theory. And when it's this homogenized, you don't have all the, all the spatial heterogeneity. Uh, you can use it, and it sort of treats neutrons basically as if they were, they were flowing. And uh, it's... it's it's mathematically much simpler, and, and it's these 3D codes that are run many times to, to op optimize fuel composition and fuel movement, because when you refuel a reactor, you'll take some of this fuel out, and you'll put fresh fuel in, and you may take some of the existing fuel in there and move it around. So you get the, the, the power level remains uh, relatively flat and you don't get into safety problems. There's a lot of details in that. But that's sort of how you go about the, the reactor physics thing and, and get up to being able to uh, calculate the composition and figure out what fuel to put in and what you're getting back out. Uh, I mentioned depletion. Uh, the depletion calculation uses, a, uses few group fluxes. You weight the cross sections for many radionuclides to yield the total flux, which, which is a single value, it's not a function of energy, and one energy group cross-sections. Again, they are not a function of energy. Then you put these in, a, uh, in, a, in a, another computer code to pr predict the buildup and decay of many ra radionuclides as a function of time. And so what you would be doing here is you would ping-pong back and forth between the 3D calculation and maybe you'd run that you know, three months or something like that and recalculate the, the cross sections and the flux level, then go to your depletion and figure out what the new one, you know, the, the new composition is. Then you start with that and you do the next flux, multi-group cross section, then the depletion, and you keep going back that and marching through it uh, over time. 
Um, let's see. And uh, once you get this kind of information, which is the radionuclide concentration, you can convert it to all sorts of other things. You can calculate gamma ray intensities. You can calculate decay heat. All of this stuff, if, if you know all of the radionuclides you have in there and their half-lives, you're off to the races. Uh, you don't need the Boltzmann equation for this. Uh, you saw the uh, so-called Bateman equations. Uh, and it just describes the buildup and decay of radionuclides, one energy group. Uh, it can be solved in closed form for many cases, but it's, it's a bit tedious to do so in any but the most simple cases. So again, computer codes are, are used there. Uh, and, a, and a closed form can't be used uh, in all cases because uh, mathematically, you can get into positions where a radionuclide produces itself. And uh, which example do I want to use? Uh, I guess you could start out with, say, Neptunium-237, which you can make plutonium-238 to 239 to 240, 241, which decays to americium-241, which alpha decays to neptunium-237. This happens in, not in the fission products, but in the actinides, this can happen. And mathematically, it, it blows up. So you usually use numerical solutions here, too. Uh, this thing on the bottom is, is the uh, Bateman e equation. And computer codes exist to do this calculation. They have for years. Uh, and calculation for 1,000 radionuclides and oh, you know, 50 time points might take a second or two. It's, it's just nothing anymore. It used to take overnight. I, I used to do this. <laughs> Uh, okay, I want to talk a little bit about fast reactor physics. And I think the, the first point we need to get to is, this is again, the neutron spectrum is a function of energy. You see the thermal spectrum with the thermal peak on the left and the, the fission peak on the right. This isn't quite so pronounced. And then you see the, the uh, fast, uh, fast reactor spectrum. Uh, a fast reactor has no moderator in it, or essentially no moderator in it. So what you've got here is you, you don't get all these lower energy neutrons. You, you get your, your fission peak, and then th there is some uh, you know, elastic and inelastic collisions, so the energies do go down somewhat, but not nearly as much as when there's a moderator in there because you're deliberately avoiding materials that moderate well. That's the definition of, of, of this reactor. Uh, ramifications of a fast spectrum. Uh, critical, criticality calculations are, are somewhat simpler because you don't have the thermal reason, region and resonances aren't as important. Uh, the, the neutron spectrum, even though it gets into the resonance region, is sort of tailing off uh, quite a bit by then. Uh, but on the other hand, fissions in fission, fissionable nuclides, uh, especially uranium-238, of which there is a lot, in the reactor are a lot more important. Uh, second, re remembering back to the cross-section diagram in the 1 over V shape, cross-sections at high neutron energies are quite a bit smaller than the cross-sections at low neutron energies. The physical reason is the, the neutron doesn't spend as much time around the nucleus because it's going too fast. So it's that, that's a physical explanation for it. What that means, because the cross section's lower, is you need higher concentrations of fissile materials in these reactors to make them go to get the criticality, and the neutron fluxes tend to be higher to, to compensate for the small cross section. If you remember the, the reaction equation before the mac macroscopic cross section and the flux. Uh, another ramification uh, is there is a higher ratio of fission, neut neutron-induced fission to neutron absorption uh, for the actinides in this reactor, uh, which means, on one hand, there's fewer losses of neutrons to unproductive captures because the, uh, mm -hmm. the neutrons tend to cause more fissions. Okay. Secondly, you can convert fertile nuclides, like U-238, to fissile nuclides faster then the fissile nuclides are consumed. What that means in practice is you have a breeder reactor where if you put in 1,000 kilograms of plutonium, you might get out 1,100. 
Now that's, mm -hmm. there's no law of physics violated because what you've done is you've converted a whole bunch of U-238 to the plutonium and of course the U-238 isn't there anymore. You've just, uh, you've just improved the quality of the U-238 quite a bit, let's say, <laughs> with the fast reactor. Uh, and there's less production of minor actinides, which are conventionally neptunium, americium, and curium. Now, if you'll notice down in here, uh, the, the red bar is a, is a pressurized water reactor, a thermal reactor, and this is the fission to capture ratio. And the, uh, can I call that purple, violet, uh, is, is in a fast reactor. This is a sodium cool fast reactor is what the acronym stands for. You notice for U-235, it's about the same. U-238, uh, significantly better in the fast reactor, but if you look at the neptunium, uh, plutonium-240 especially, uh, uh, plutonium-242 and, and the americiums, which are normally not fissionable in a thermal spectrum or very, very little of it, in this reactor you get significant fissions in it. Uh, and that's why they've been considered in, in many cases for the, uh, for the transmutation thing. Can we get rid of all these actinides and help the repository and this kind of stuff? And they, they invariably look at fast reactors, and this is why. Uh, okay. Why do they fission if they're not this on? Or is that this isotope? They're, 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 they're fissionable. Remember, the definition of fissile uh, is that it can sustain, uh, uh, sustain a chain reaction. These things can't sustain a chain reaction, like, like U-235 can in particular. Now, can I find a set of minor actinides, a very specific set of minor actinides that might be able to sustain a chain reaction? Maybe I can. Uh, I might be, you know, if I could get enough curium in a pile, I might be able to do something with it. But as a practical matter, it's, it, it helps the reactor efficiency, but uh, it, it, running a reactor on it is not in the cards. Uh, I think at this point, it's too early for lunch. So let, let's keep on going with the next... Uh, first, I'm going to talk in, in a, l a little bit in some generalities, and then we'll go on and, and get into some specific reactors. Uh, sort of, what do you need in a nuclear reactor? Well, basically, the, the primary components, uh, first, you need fuel. You need the amount and composition to support a chain reaction for years. You want this to be, I'm talking about power reactors now, you want it to be in the reactor. Uh, for a number of years and, and to get your money's worth out of it, so to speak, in the form of, of energy. Uh, for this second, I'm going to treat fuel as sort of a black box, and subsequently I'm going to go into the fuels um, in more detail. Uh, then you got to put the fuel into a core. That's a tightly packed array of fuel. You take a bunch of this stuff and put it into, generally what's, I mean, in, in math, it's like a, a, it's called a right circular cylinder, meaning like a can of soup. You know, it's got flat top and bottom and more or less round. Uh, it's heterogeneous for the most part, and you've got fuel in fuel rods that's separated by a coolant and or moderator, and I'll sort of elaborate on either or both. Uh, there are some reactors, uh, Ray mentioned this morning, homogeneous reactors where the fuel is dissolved in the coolant and or the moderator. Uh, they've been looked at in the past, some, some amount of development done, but they're not being seriously pursued at this point. But they, they, they do exist, or, or have existed and, and exist in concept. Uh, all right, now, coolant. You've got this reactor, it's generating a lot of power, 3,000 megawatts thermal, uh, and you've got to cool the thing, and you need a good coolant. Uh, first, no coolant is ideal. Uh, the kind of things you want is you want a low melting point. In other words, you don't want to have to worry about keeping your reactor warm uh, to keep the coolant from freezing up on you and then have to reheat it. Uh, and usually you'd like a, a relatively high boiling point. 
uh, and that's as pointed out this morning, if the boiling point isn't high enough, then as you go to heat it up, the pressure increases, which means just, I mean, the higher pressure, everything's got to be thicker, more massive, and more, more risky to some extent. Now, there, there are cases, if, you, if you're in a reactor where you want your coolant to boil, well, that, that's a little bit different, but uh, <laughs> for the most part, I think a high boiling point is good. You want it non-corrosive. Uh, so it doesn't eat away all your components. Want it to have a low neutron absorption cross-section, just like the moderator. Uh, you want it to be stable at elevated temperatures and radiation. Uh, in other words, not to disintegrate into other things or plate out or generally crap up your reactor. Uh, you'd like it to have low induced reactivity. In other words, when a neutron hits it and makes a capture product, you'd like it to not have a lot of gamma rays because eventually you've got to get near this stuff to refuel the reactor. Uh, well, you may have to get near it, let me put it that way. Uh, no reaction with turbine working fluid. And what I mean there is if you've got a coolant in a reactor, uh, very often the, f the turbine working fluid is, is usually water. And you would n not like to have the coolant in the reactor have a bad reaction with water because even though they're in theory you keep them separate, there's leaks. I mean, things happen. So, uh, high heat capacity and heat transfer coefficient just helps uh, uh, get the heat out to uh, to the turbines. Uh, low pumping power, low cost, and ready availability. It's it's a great wish list. Uh, but the problem is, as I said, uh, no coolant meets them all favorably. Uh, the A's and D's are advantages and disadvantages, and the M is sort of medium or middling, if you will. Uh, and these are the, uh, the uh, coolants that have been uh, considered. Some of them we've talked about before in terms of being uh, moderators. Uh, others are coolants we, we mentioned just a, a little bit. Uh, and uh, down here, this last line, the, these numbers are a little bit dated but this is the percent of world reactors that use these various coolants. And of course, the by far uh, winner in this whole thing is, is light water reactors. Whether that choice would be made uh, if we were starting from scratch and didn't have the, uh, the start in like the nuclear navy uh, that, that led us down the path of PWRs and this kind of stuff, whether they all make the same choices, I, I, uh, again, I don't know. But uh, that's where we are, and I don't see it changing a lot. The heavy water is a reactor I'm not going to talk about hardly at all. It's, it's called a, a, a can-do reactor. It's, it's, uh, it's a water reactor, obviously, uh, using heavy water, and uh, can use natural uranium if you want. And there's a number in the world, various countries, Canada's uh, design. Uh, there are a few carbon dioxide reactors left in the United Kingdom. These are legacy designs, and they're on their way out. Uh, the, uh, the, some of the contenders here, uh, helium uh, mentioned this morning. We'll talk about some more about the uh, uh, high-temperature gas-cooled reactor, where, where helium is the coolant there. Uh, has a lot of uh, advantages to it, I mean, in terms of being inert. The, the problem is it's, it's not the greatest heat transfer medium in the world, and because it's a gas, even though the reactor is, operates under substantial pressure, it takes a lot more energy to move, to move gas around and circulate it and get the heat out than it does a liquid. That's just the way engineering is, because, because it isn't dense enough. Uh, a, uh, another contender, in, in many people's uh, mind is the, uh, the al alkali metals, sodium and potassium have been used in the past, but pretty much the focus is on sodium. Potassium just doesn't seem to offer very many advantages. It's more expensive and has some downsides. Uh, and so the focus is on fast reactors using sodium as coolants. Uh, these are some other metal coolants. Uh, uh, lead and bismuth that have been considered. Uh, the U.S. isn't much a fan of them, but the, the Russians like them. Uh, and uh, they do have uh, some of their nuclear navy and uh, other ships use reactors that are cooled by lead or bismuth or mixtures of the two. Uh, What's the M mean on the chart? Middle and in between. 
Uh, molten salts, uh, we, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, they have a lot of uh, attractive properties. Uh, I should say the sodium potassium, a uh, couple of downs, well, I'll talk about that a little later. Let me just keep going. What's uh, the difference between that and the sodium potassium then, to have its own column, the molten salts? Uh, okay, these others, uh, I'm sorry, what, the question is, what's, why does a molten salt have its... Example. A molten salt coolant would typically be composed of a mixture of something like lithium and beryllium fluoride. In other words, it's a chemical compound, a salt, whereas the sodium, potassium, lead, bismuth are all metals and not a compound. And organics were considered in the early days of reactor development. A couple of small reactors were actually built using organic coolants. But there you get into stability problems. The organic just isn't sufficiently stable at high temperatures and in a high radiation field. So it would break apart into stuff that would just crap up all the fuel and it just, that duck didn't fly. So. What were the organics used? What, what, what organics were used? Oh, I'm not going to remember. That. It's not a simple one. Well, yes, but it, what organics were used? Yeah, and, and there's an ortho and a para and something else, and they use just one of them. And, oh. <laughs> and, and why is one of the criteria not eventual disposal of the coolant? Because some of those coolants up there present significant issues when you shut the reactor down or decommission it. Yeah. Uh, the question is why is disposal of the coolant you know, at shutdown not an issue in, in, in the waste issue? Uh, a number of them, these going across the left up to carbon dioxide, I mean, well, basically become a low-level waste. Uh, and, and, and the we, uh, well, helium does it. You can probably clean that up and, and, and reuse it. It's valuable enough. Uh, and ditto the carbon dioxide. The two water reactors make tritium, and so the water, and you're not going to do an isotopic separation on it, so you end up having to treat that as it as a low-level waste. Um, Canadians do remove the tree. Some, yeah. <laughs> Not all of it, but some. Yeah. Uh, and... I mean, like sodium, disposal of sodium is, sodium. is, is an issue. Sodium, sodium disposal can and has been a problem and can be a problem. I'm just not... I'm trying to think of whether any reactor designer has ever had the foresight to look that far ahead, <laughs> and, 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 and I don't think so. <laughs> they, uh, I, I don't think anybody's ever looked that far ahead. I mean, from the standpoint of just simple common sense, some of those you could never use. I mean, not in not in the D and D where you were ever thinking you might have to D and D that that facility. I mean, lead. I mean, yeah. where in God's name are you going to get rid of? It? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I mean, you're you're going to have, have a bunch of lead, lead, lead bars, <laughs> and uh, well, the the, the follow-up here was what, what what are you going to do with a bunch of lead? If you couldn't find another reactor operating on lead. You're going you're gonna to make a bunch of lead bars that are contaminated with some other radioactive isotopes and have to manage it as a radioactive waste, a, mi a mixed radioactive waste, as you might, might imagine. Uh, and uh, fortunately, we don't have to face that, I, I don't think, over here. And I don't want to think about what the Russians do. <laughs> so, <laughs> Okay. No. No. Well, there are no power reactors operating. Now, I th I think there's a couple of I'll call them uh, test reactors. You know, the the developmental reactors that are you know uh, that are going to lead up to uh, the commercial ones. I thought the Japanese had an HTTR and maybe the Germans. Uh, but there, there's no commercial reactors at this point. There, there was one uh, that operated some years ago, the Fort St. Vrain reactor in, in Colorado. 
Uh, it was built, it was 300 megawatts electric. I would call that a demonstration plant. Uh, didn't operate particularly well. Uh, I'm not sure whether they did, or that they had aspirations, but I'm not sure that they did. Uh, anyway, moving on. Uh, now, moderator. <clears throat> uh, for thermal reactors only, obviously, I've talked about the moderators here al already. Uh, for water-cooled reactors, the coolant is the moderator pretty much, at least for our water-cooled reactors. The can-dos, the Canadian reactors, that's not, that's not the case. Uh, they, they have sort of a, 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 well, the Canadians, you can't separate the two. They've got sort of a static moderator and then a bunch of flowing coolant, and you get some moderating from both of them, I guess is the fairest way to say it. Uh, <clears throat> Only other moderator use expected to be used is graphite. Uh, at this point, looking at helium coolant, uh, a future, perhaps a molten salt coolant, although nobody's chasing that very seriously. Uh, the density, th this is the density of, of the graphite. Uh, there's a theoretical density, but it's the reactor graphite isn't quite that dense, as it, dense as theoretical. And uh, the, the annealing business, uh, may be a problem if, uh, although I, I think they'll probably be at sufficient temperatures. Let me elaborate that a bit. Uh, Ray mentioned this morning the, the Wigner energy that builds up through dislocations of, of the graphite, the carbon to carbon bonds, and can build up rather substantially. He mentioned that sort of, sort of the dimensional problem. Uh, but there's another problem, and that is that energy can build up and build up as sort of a latent or uh, potential energy, and if you all of a sudden heat the graphite up somewhat, and not a huge amount, not like a reactor accident, that energy can release all at once, and then the graphite can get, you know, can can start to burn, and you can release radionuclides and this kind of thing, and that has happened once uh, in one of the reactors in the United Kingdom, the wind scale reactor. Uh, which operated at a fairly low temperature. They went through some kind of a temperature excursion. The Wigner energy was released, and they had a fire, and they put some radionuclides up the stack and, uh, and, and this kind of thing. Uh, it's not particularly difficult to, to avoid. In, in a low temperature situation, you just periodically run the reactor temperature up to get the bonds back together. Uh, without having so much, you get in trouble. And for the reactors we're talking about, they operate at such a high temperature, it's not going to build back up. They'll just stay in alignment. Um, okay, major components uh, of a reactor plant. You need a pressure vessel for water and gas-cooled reactors. And I differentiate that and, and leave out some of the other reactors because, for example, a sodium-cooled reactor, the sodium is operating at at basically atmospheric pressure. So you don't need a pressure vessel, you just need a, you know, basically a closed vessel or a, or a tank or something like that. Uh, you need coolant pumps or compressors, depending on what you're gonna move around. You need heat exchangers for some, for some reactor types. You need your turbine generator. The turbine spins when the working fluid hits it and then spins the generator, which makes your electricity. Uh, you need a condenser. Uh, or cooler and, and cooling towers. Uh, you have to remove the low-grade heat to complete the ther thermodynamic cycle. Uh, all interconnected piping, you've got to have waste processing in the plant. Uh, you need some kind of a water pool to store spent fuel that's just come out of the reactor. And you need all sorts of labs and shops and other things to handle uh, mildly radioactive items. Uh, Talk a little bit about some of these uh, cooling towers. Uh, these this shows um, uh, two cooling uh, cooling tower concepts. On the left, the so-called uh, wet or evaporative, where uh, basically the, the hot water c comes in and it gets sprayed and has direct contact with the air, and it's sort of evaporative cooling is is the way that works. And your cool water comes out. And this tower design is, is natural circulation. Uh, and the other one is a closed system where the hot water comes in, the cool comes out, and 
there's no direct contact between the cooling air and the water. It's all conduction through pipes and fins and radiators and that kind of stuff. Generally, these have to have fans in them to get enough air velocity and cooling without the evaporation effect. Uh, both cool types of cooling towers exist in general in commerce. Uh, for, the, for the most part, in, in, in reactors, they use the one on the left, evaporative. Now, one other point, uh, th these are shown as the hyperbolic designs, and I suspect most of you have at least seen pictures. If not, in fact, you're driving down the road and you see some of these huge hyperbolic towers a couple of hundred feet tall or, or more. A hyperbolic tower doesn't equal the presence of a nuclear plant, and a nuclear plant cooling tower doesn't necessarily have to be hyperbolic. A number of the plants, of course, if they're, they're on a river, they're on an ocean, they don't need a tower at all. They just have a have a direct cooling loop, uh, but cooling tower designs, especially the uh, the, the the dry type, well, I, I guess both types, also can be in the form of sort of a bank of of cooling. Uh, I don't want to call them towers, but co cooling modules that might be 30 feet tall, and, and the whole raft of them might be 100, 150, 200 feet long, uh, and they can be fairly close to the ground and given how close you can get to a nuclear plant, for example, you might not even be able to see them uh, because they have a low enough profile. So there's... Uh, it really fakes out the news industry, right? Because they always think that that's... A yeah, problem. I know. I, <laughs> down where I live, there's a, you know, there's some gas plants down there that, that uh, use hyperbolic towers. These are just... I uh, found three pictures of it. The one on the left, or lower left, is from someplace in Europe. Uh, somebody, it's, <laughs> somebody did a lot of work there. Uh, okay, we've got to have some waste processing in this plant when you're dealing with radioactive materials, even though the, you know, the, the fuel is in the, in, in the pressure vessel, you still got some waste processing issues. Uh, first, liquid waste processing. Uh, in, invariably, you lose some water out of this system. There can be leaks and uh, other things, and, and you, have, you need makeup water. Uh, in addition, uh, corrosion control is a major issue, and so you have to control the water chemistry very carefully. And that means not only the, like the pH and this kind of stuff, but inevitably, you know, some of the rods are going to leak a little bit of something. Uh, you've got all these neutrons in the core. Some make activation products and in metals, and the metals corrode, so they dissolve. So you get radioactivity moving around in, in your cooling water. Uh, and it, it gets in odd places in piping and pumps and can make maintenance a headache. So you try to keep the water uh, fairly clean. Use processes like ion exchange or reverse osmosis uh, to purify the water and concentrate the, uh, uh, the, the stuff you don't want. Uh, maybe evaporate it further to concentrate the dissolved species. The water, of course, gets recycled back into the reactor. But eventually, the concentrate would be stabilized by, by like grouting it or in some kind of an absorptive medium, and you put it in a barrel, and it becomes a low-level waste for disposal. Uh, and all of the plants have to do uh, this kind of thing. They have various, uh, various approaches in different plants. There's no one standard way to do it. Uh, gaseous effluent, uh, there, there is uh, a gaseous effluent, uh, nuclear facilities. Uh, operate on a, a negative pressure kind of a thing. In other words, the, the higher the radiation level, the more negative the pressure, and the pressure continues to drop and drop. And you do that, of course, by, by drawing a vacuum at the, from the most, uh, uh, the most radioactive part of it. And that can contain, uh, there, there's some short-lived isotopes of, of various gases that, that, that get produced and, and get released out of the, uh, out of the coolant. And what you do is you run that through something like a charcoal bed. These isotopes tend to be quite short-lived, and, and the charcoal bed just sort of holds them up for long enough so they decay away. Uh, and uh, then the resulting gas stream uh, keeps on going through a high-efficiency filter, and then it goes, goes out of stack. But eventually, the charcoal beds and filters become solid waste. And again, they get put in barrels and, and treated like a, a low-level waste. Uh, the solid wastes come from the foregoing. Also, there's all sorts of other solid stuff. You got lab equipment where you're doing 
analytical work on your coolant or whatever, protective gear, all these little funny white um, sea suits where, where they're out there during refueling and doing maintenance, failed equipment uh, that's been in contact with radioactive water, and, and eventually, you know, the, so there's a sort of a steady stream of this stuff. Uh, it's not a it's not a huge volume, but uh, again, you, you send it to a low level waste disposal facility. Uh, and most of the waste, uh, forget setting aside spent fuel, but most of the waste from reactors is low level waste that's acceptable for going to one of the operating low level waste disposal facilities. Now there is a small volume of it that is not. It is usually some reactor. Uh, internals, and it's so highly irradiated that it exceeds the limit for these places, and so the reactors, uh, reactor operators are just holding on to that pending identification of a place uh, to dispose of it, and the Department of Energy is, is working along those lines. Uh, radiation protection, uh, it's primarily, I mean, accidents aside. Radiation protection routinely is primarily an issue from the workers because they're the ones that get up close to this equipment where you've got your corrosion products and this kind of stuff. The public's just too far away and uh, kept too far away. Uh, your radiation sources, I mean, the reactor itself is emits a lot of radiation during operation, but it's sealed up in a, in a containment building and people don't go in there during operation. Uh, you've got the trace contamination in the cooling water, and uh, like I said, places where radionuclides uh, accumulate. And in these plants, they they manage worker dose very carefully. It's uh, they all have to carry personal meters. It's tracked. Uh, the, you know, they they've got records on all this uh, as as to who gets what. There's limits on it, and if they start getting near them, uh, they 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 don't get to go back in radiation zones anymore. Uh, and the industry has a pretty good record over the last couple of decades of continuously reducing worker occupational dose. They've done a good job of it. Uh, radiation shielding, most shielding is, is concrete or water in these plants. Uh, sometimes you'll use metals like steel or whatever if space is tight, but generally uh, water is pretty cheap and concrete isn't all that bad. Uh, and uh, they, they carefully plan maintenance. Uh, and they limit time, increase distance. It's the as low as reasonably achievable uh, approach for worker dose. Uh, that they, 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 they plan work activities carefully and, uh, you know, you, you don't go in there and have a conversation in one of those zones. It's, it's planned, you, you know, you do the business, you, you get out, and a lot of pre-planning in terms of you got the right tools, you know what you're doing kind of stuff. Um, public safety talked about the effluents, like the gas stream. I'll talk about accidents more later. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Uh, this is getting close to the uh, reactor design business, and when reactor development, uh, it, well, reactor deployment and reactor development sort of deployment hit a bottom for the, uh, well, late 80s and all through the 90s, uh, but talk started in the early 2000s and the Department of Energy started development work uh, on more advanced reactors about that time and, and came up with this sort of evolution of nuclear power kind of a chart where you started out with some of these very early designs. These were relatively small reactors and, and had to be viewed as, as prototypes. They didn't operate all that well, but you, you know, you got to learn by doing to some extent. Uh, Magnox is a uh, graphite moderated uh, reactor uh, built by the United Kingdom. There are none in this country and they're being shut down in the UK. Uh, Dresden and uh, shipping port is an early PWR and Dresden I believe was a BWR, small BWR. Uh, then you got into commercial power where there was enough confidence they started building plants of uh, a, a number of plants of substantial size. Uh, PWRs and BWRs in this country uh, can do reactors. Uh, in Canada and uh, in a few other countries. And then, uh, but they had their difficulties there and operating experience, I guess I'd call it mixed. Uh, but as they went on, th they learned in some of the later plants of, uh, that were built before uh, 
all buildings ceased, so-called generation three were more advanced in that they learned what, what the problems were and uh, things started uh, operating a lot better here in terms of the reliability and the online factors. And the industry has also had in the last oh, 10, 15 years a, a, a pretty good record of increasing online availability. So these things are, I think the fleet average is up at the 90% or low 90% at this point of, you know, 90 or let's say 90% of the year, these things are online generating power, usually full power in the case of a nuclear plant. So there's been a lot of uh, success here. And with global climate and whatever, uh, there's been a move afoot over the last several years to begin deploying what is the so-called Generation 3 Plus, which are evolutionary designs. They're not radically different than these that, uh, that are built and operating, uh, but they've sharpened their pencil a little bit and they have improved safety features, claim to have improved economics, and I'll elaborate on some of the whys and word of fours uh, here uh, probably after lunch, but, uh, and all of these, uh, the AP600 and AP1000 are, are PWRs. This is a European PWR. Uh, this is a Japanese BWR. This is sort of a US BWR, sort of. Uh, and then there's the so-called Generation 4, which was uh, uh, a lot of the, this evolution here was done by industry not so much by the government because this, this was already pretty commercial. Over here you've got generation four which is some really uh, advanced designs that aren't, by and large, they aren't ready for prime time right now. They, they're still subject to R&D which means they're in Department of Energy's domain, uh, domain DOE and E. And uh, it's supposed to be, uh, you know, oh, the, this is all the attributes they think they want to have. And some of these uh, are, you know, in, in my view, uh, let me call it reasonable, uh, have some potential. The, the sodium-cooled fast reactor has, has some issues, but its potential and uh, the, uh, the high-temperature gas-cooled reactor does. Some of the other reactor design, and, and I'm going to talk more about a little bit about those uh, this afternoon. Uh, some of the other reactor designs are... Well, I'm skeptical to say the least. Uh, there's a, a, a reactor, uh, it's a gas-cooled fast reactor, uh, and uh, I think they're going to have problems getting that reactor safe enough. Uh, there, there's just so little in the core, if they get a little bit of a transient, that there's not tons of water or tons of sodium or tons of graphite to, to help moderate uh, that's the wrong, I don't want to use moderate here, uh, uh, to, to help uh, control any, any excursions. It's just basically a bunch of metal clad fuel rods and a bunch of helium. And that just isn't a recipe for stability. Um, and uh, there's a super critical water reactor which operates at extremely high pressures. It is a water reactor, but a super critical fluid, it's, it's not liquid and it's not gas, but it's both. It's, it's, it's strange stuff and it's hard to explain. And, and it, it has very different behavior and uh, it's been proposed because you can operate it at very high temperatures, but it's got a, a lot of issues in terms of controllability and corrosion for that matter. Really high temperature water is sort of corrosive. But there's a number of those and uh, I, 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 think, uh, I think all of them I think I have little cartoons maybe in the backup slides this afternoon. What about the small modular reactors? Yeah. I was going to say this. Uh, question was on small modular reactors. I'll talk some about those this afternoon, too. Uh, okay. At the uh, Blue Ribbon Commission, at several of the Blue Ribbon Commission meetings, there is a very vocal contingent for Oak Ridge promoting uh, molten salt reactors. You mentioned that a couple of times. Obviously, there are some advantages, but there must be some disadvantages. Or, 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 or. And it showed up uh, molten salt as being uh, one of the better uh, water reactors. Well, the, the, the molten salt reactor that 
is is being bandied about is a molten salt cooled graphite moderated system uh, and one of those well it, it has a number of advantages the uh, the 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 online refueling a number of safety advantages if if you're in that kind of a system uh, you don't have any cladding to disrupt and one of those reactors was built a small demonstration plant at Oak Ridge and and the safety system is basically does everybody remember what a freeze plug is <laughs> you used to have them in your radiator block so when it froze in the winter it'd pop out instead of cracking the block but in the bottom of the reactor there's a couple of plugs of molten salt that are kept frozen by active cooling if the reactor starts to go out of control, you either cut the power or the heat supersedes it, the plugs melt and they drain into critically safe, naturally convective, convectively cooled uh, drain tanks. Uh, and it operates at a very high temperature, so you get your, uh, you get, you get your thermal efficiency advantages. Now, the, the downsides of it at, at the time, the demonstration plant was built. There was a program wanting to go to bigger scale, but what you've got is this molten salt, which is fairly benign in terms of corrosion. But you got every fission product in the universe in there, and as you might expect, one of those fission products started c causing a little bit of uh, of cracking in the in the uh, reactor vessel, uh, and. At the time, there was an intense competition between various reactor types to, as to who was going to go big time and who was going to get left behind. And that corrosion issue was enough to get the molten salt reactor uh, left behind in, in favor of the sodium-cooled fast reactor, which, is the, which gained the most uh, traction at the time. Now, the corrosion problem, at least that corrosion problem, uh, they had enough uh, enough momentum left to look into it, and it turns out fission product tellurium, of all things, does that. And by tweaking the alloy composition, they can they can fix that. Uh, so uh, I've always um, intellectually sort of liked the reactor, but it it just in the U.S. it just doesn't have any traction uh, at, at this point with with hardly anybody. I mean, it has a few proponents, but on on the scale of of government and whatever, that isn't where DOE is putting its money. I had somebody else there. Yeah, you, your chart on slide five had a sodium cooled reactor. Where is it? How old is it? <sighs> that, I suspect, refers to the. It was up near Toledo, wasn't it, Alan? No, no, those are, that, that, that was a worldwide. You're talking about the worldwide chart. Yeah, yeah. No, and. Uh, we, we in this country we operated the Fermi plant up up near D Detroit, but that's been long since shut down. Uh, I got to believe that probably refers at this point to the BN 350, yeah, right, Russian. Russia, and uh, and like I say, that those numbers are a little bit dated. The the Japanese keep trying to start back up the Manju plant, but those are sort of those are demonstration level plants. Uh, Uh, possibly, yeah. What's TVA proposing to put at the uh, old uh, molten salt reactor, sodium reactor? Uh, the, the question was, what's TVA thinking about putting at the old? Yeah, the site there. Oh, oh the see, uh, Clinch River Breeder site? Yeah, at the Clinch River. Right? Uh, it, TBA is uh, sort of dancing around some kind of a small modular reactor that will be a the one they're looking at is basically a small pressurized water reactor and I've got I've got a cartoon of that design we'll get into here in, in the afternoon I think what's next this is a great place to stop <laughs> high noon <laughs> and uh, see you at one o'clock back here at one o'clock Now moving on, I'm going to talk a little bit about nuclear uh, power plant thermal cycles or non-thermal cycles. Uh, the, most, uh, the most common one is the uh, Rankine or steam cycle 
where basically you've got a heat source. No nuclear reactors don't have flames, but I sort of like the rest of the diagram. So <laughs> that that heats up water and makes steam and drives a turbine that spins a generator. Then you have to go on down to the uh, condenser and remove the low-grade heat, and you pump it around in a circle. This is the Brayton cycle, which operates. It's for uh, not necessarily gas-cooled reactors, but it's a, uh, a gas reactor, not steam. Uh, doesn't condense the working fluid. And I'll start over here. You got a heat source, which is your reactor, and you've got pressurized gas. You heat it up in the reactor, and it goes through a gas turbine, uh, not unlike what uh, natural gas fired plants have, and spins it, and there's a generator in, in the middle that makes your electricity. Uh, the the uh, gas comes out, and we're essentially talking helium here. It's the only real game in town for, for nuclear. Goes through a, a recuperator. I'll talk it, talk about that for a second. And the co somewhat cooled gas goes to uh, low-grade heat rejection, goes back in and on the same uh, uh, axis as your, uh, your, your turbine is a gas compressor to get the pressure back up to reactor pressures. And then it goes through the recuperator and uses the leftover heat that uh, comes out of the turbine and then goes back into the reactor and just keeps going around. And this radiator thing is basically your, your cooling tower or, or whatever you have to, to reject heat. So that's sort of the hope of the future for the uh, helium-cooled reactors. Um, and then uh, third, it's, it's not a power cycle, I guess, but uh, some of the reactors are seriously looking at using the reactor heat for process heat. In other words, there's, there's no turbine, no gas turbine or steam turbine. Basically, the working fluid or the reactor coolant goes out, and in a secondary loop, you heat up something, like maybe a molten salt or whatever, just to transfer heat. And it goes into a pipeline over to the plant next door. There might be a petroleum refinery, chemical manufacturing, somebody that needs a lot of heat and maybe a fair amount of high-grade heat. And when I talk about HTGRs, I'll, I'll elaborate on that just a little bit. Now, reactor designs, finally. Uh, as a framework for this, uh, first I'll talk about uh, frame it with the type of moderator or it doesn't have a moderator and then the coolant. Uh, water moderated reactors, I'm going to essentially focus on light water reactors at this point and, and not the can do. Uh, and then graphite moderated reactors, gas cooled, I guess I shouldn't have left those in there when I had, I put some of this in backup slides. And then unmoderated, which is uh, uh, sodium cooled mainly. A little bit on some legacy reactors, uh, a couple of those of interest, and then a little bit on small modular reactors. So that's that's the program here for a while. This is the world's most popular reactor type, pressurized water reactor. Uh, and to give you the flow of things, this is your reactor vessel, uh, some coolant pumps. I'll say a little bit more about those. Uh, but the important feature is, here is uh, the reactor heats up the water, which is circulated to a steam generator. And then there's a second loop where the steam goes out to the turbine and the generator and gets condensed and, and then just comes back in and keeps going out around in a circle. Uh, the rest of this, I think, is pretty ordinary and, and we've talked about, but it has this secondary loop. Uh, is, is one of the hallmarks of a, a pressurized water reactor. Uh, a little bit more of, of a cartoon. This is the uh, reactor vessel itself. Uh, you've got coolant pumps. Uh, you can't see all of them, but uh, there's two of them showing back here. Um, the, uh, the, the steam generator, uh, a once through steam generator, and then a pressurizer. Uh, and to explain that, the, the water in this primary loop is all liquid water. And I think you might have experienced in your home where uh, if the plumbing isn't quite right and somebody slams off a faucet, you get the, the, the pipe, pipes rattling. Uh, and uh, it, it's sort of aggravating. And the cure for that is basically you get a plumber in and they, in, in one of the horizontal pipes, they put a vertical pipe with a cap that becomes an air pocket. And of course the air is compressible and you get rid of that water hammer. 
Well, that's exactly what this pressurize, pressurizer is. It's, uh, it's got air or gas space up at the top. It's got heaters. And by heating it up, they make steam and they bring the system up to pressure, which is around a couple of thousand PSI. Uh, and, and they don't have water hammer problems, which can be a real problem with this much power going on. Uh, a little bit more inside the thing. Uh, the pressure vessel, 10 to 20 feet in diameter, 40 to 60 feet tall, 10 inches thick. It's, it's carbon steel lined with stainless steel. Uh, some of the uh, key elements here within the pressure vessel, you have a, a bottom plate that supports the spent fuel with, with little slots for fuel assemblies in a roughly cylindrical array around the outside. It's what, or what's called uh, what I used to call a core barrel or a uh, shroud. Uh, some call it a shroud now, but that'll get you confused later on. And what that does, I'm having a hard time reading over here which one's inlet, but the water comes, uh, I guess that's inlet, comes in, runs down the outside between the pressure vessel and the core barrel, and then turns and moves up through the fuel assemblies and then to the outlet nozzle. There's one right there. Uh, and there's a, a plate on the top to hold everything down. And the control rods that are used in this come in from the top. And of course, there's, there's a lid on it that uh, is, is closed tight when it's operating. And for refueling, you take that lid off to get your fuel assemblies off and the new ones in. This is the uh, in inside of a pressure vessel with the lid removed. There's an assembly going in or out and uh, a number of them in here and you can see some open slots and this is the core barrel going around there. Um, not much else than that. Coolant pumps. Uh, don't have a horsepower rating on these but they're very large uh, relative to, to people and other than that it's a pretty straightforward pump for moving uh, water around uh, except for its size. Now, this is a steam generator. It's a so-called U-tube steam generator. Uh, you see the reactor schematic and the hot water comes up and it goes through tubes up here and then makes a turn and comes back down the other side, goes back into the reactor and this is the uh, primary coolant circulation pump and it just goes around and around and up in here on the outside of the tubes, water boils and these little gizmos up here are uh, uh, water steam steam separators because the the boiling will entrain water droplets and you want to knock those out and have a uh, have pure steam without any water droplets going out to your turbine uh, and this is a photograph of one uh, in life they're pretty good size but reasonably straightforward now pwr control uh, the, the rods are inserted from the top they in general have three kinds of rods shut down rods which are only used when the reactor uh, criticality wise is, is already shut down but to assure that criticality has ceased and stays ceased while they're working with it. Full length rods that are usually withdrawn but are used to initially shut it down uh, under uh, if you want to do it a little bit more quickly and then there's some part length rods that are not nearly as long as the fuel assembly and that's used to shape the power axially. If you get the power sort of in a core this large can uh, sometimes begin to oscillate a little bit and you use part length rods to control it in a, in a localized region. Typically made of an alloy of, of silver, indium and cadmium in just in, in, in a long rod about the, about the size of a fuel rod. Uh, now for routine control in this reactor you don't use control rods. Uh, you vary the concentration of dissolved boric acid in the coolant. Remember, boron was one of our neutron poisons in some earlier table. And you vary the concentration of it to, uh, initially it's, it's pretty high because you've got some fresh fuel in there, so you've got a lot of U-235. So you'll have fairly concentrated, you know, maybe 500,000 ppm. And then as the reactor operates, you use an ion exchanger to slowly remove the boric acid and as the ability of the fuel to support fissions goes down, you take the poison out so you maintain your criticality. Um, 
and uh, it's you know it's it's very uniform, it's very stable, and it has has worked well in the PWRs. Uh, a, a, a word of nomenclature called a scram, which is an, an emergency emergency shutdown of a reactor if any one of a number of events happen, uh, either it happens automatically or it can be done manually by the operators. And basically that means driving the rods in within a one or two second period uh, into the reactor and shutting it down immediately, even though there's boric acid in there. It's, uh, and any number of things can, can uh, cause this kind of thing. There can be in-plant or, or safety issues. And it can be something as simple as a thunderstorm knocked out some big switch yard down there and all of a sudden there's no place for the electricity to go and you can't keep running the reactor with nothing without a place for it to go so it shuts itself down pretty quickly. And so they're, they're, not, they're not daily events but they're certainly not un uncommon events either. Oh, and, and a story associated with that, the, uh, the uh, s source or uh, of the word scram has, has been widely debated and, and never decided. There's a couple of theories. One is, uh, those of you, you might remember the first nuclear reactor was the, uh, uh, the graphite pile, uh, the Chicago pile under uh, Stag Field in Chicago where they put some natural uranium in it and withdrew some rods and they got a very low level criticality. That was the first uh, nuclear reactor. Well, at the time the physicists there, Fermi and others, they, I mean, this was uncharted territory and they didn't know what the thing was going to do. So they had poison rods and uh, elegantly enough, they, they withdrew some of these emergency rods and tied them in the out position with a rope. And it's, it's alleged that they put some guy up on the top with an ax and said, if we give you the signal, you chop the rope and drop the rod in to shut it down, and that's the safety control rod axe man. That's, that's one story. The, the other story is, if, if you go back to that same time period, which is the, uh, you know, the uh, early to mid 40s, uh, scram was a pretty common word you know, in, in conversation. You know, scram, get out of here, and that kind of stuff. So, and, and then it, then it meant, you know, if, if we have an emergency, scram, <laughs> get out of Dodge. So the truth is not known. Uh, these reactors, uh, unknown, uh, I didn't actually tumble into this till a year, year and a half ago, but over the last number of years for the existing reactor fleet, there's been what's called power uprating, uh, which is they take an existing nuclear plant and by making various changes in it, they, uh, they get more power out of the same reactor. Uh, now these activities, they, they have to conceive of them, they gotta go to the NRC and get a change in their license condition so they're looked at. But what they've got is uh, just because we know cross sections better, we have better computation, uh, uh, improved uh, reactor physics and heat transfer predictions uh, over just the old correlations, they got about a 2% in, in increase in power uh, and then improved instrumentation, in other words, being able to monitor more accurately what is actually happening in the reactor, which lets them run closer to the margin on the fuel, 2 to 7 percent. And then during, uh, during outages and whatever, they've gone back in and installed better major equipments, more efficient pumps, more efficient steam generators, and, uh, and uh, gotten anywhere from 7 to 20 percent, uh, depending on the plant. And net across the, uh, the fleet, and the U.S. fleet is 104 power reactors now, uh, they've gotten the equivalent of five new reactors without building a reactor, which uh, I found sort of astounding, but nevertheless. Uh, oh, while I'm here, I wanted to talk about a, a Russian version on a pressurized water reactor. Uh, there is not much different, not a lot different about it, called a VBER, and I'm not even going to try to go where, what, what the Russian is, but it, it's their pressurized water reactor. Uh, the assemblies are sort of a little different configuration, but conceptually the same. For reasons I never figured out, it has a horizontal steam generator. And why would you want to generate steam in something that's a long vessel and not real high has uh, eluded me. But nevertheless, that's what they do. Uh, this is a, you know, relatively current design. 
it, it does have a, a full containment, uh, you know, around the outside and, uh, and, and meets uh, more or less international standards for these kind of reactors. And we'll get to one that sort of doesn't here in a little bit. Um, now, I've sort of talked about Generation 3, our existing fleet, a little bit. Uh, you remember the Generation 3 Plus, which is, are the ones that are being marketed and, uh, and, and built at this point. Uh, an AP-1000 is being built down at the uh, Vodal plant in uh, South Carolina, I think it is. Georgia. Georgia, you're right. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a Westinghouse design, which is their AP-600 and 1000, and that's the, uh, roughly the electric output of them. Uh, AP is supposed to stand for advanced passive, and a little bit more about that in a second. Arriva, which is the French uh, uh, vendor, uh, has a what they call a U.S. European pressurized water reactor uh, that they're working to get licensed, and Mitsubishi has a uh, pressurized water reactor design. And I think various U.S. utilities are considering all of these, but you can sort of debate how serious it is in, in case of some of them. Uh, the one that's going ahead, like I said, is an AP-1000. Now, one of the things they've done in Generation 3 Plus uh, is uh, basically they've been able to uh, sort of redesign the thing so they don't have as many, uh, uh, so, so much equipment in it. Uh, fewer valves, fewer pumps, it's less to go wrong, it doesn't cost you as much at the outset. Uh, and the less equipment uh, allows building size to uh, be shrunk, which means you don't have to pour as much concrete. And this is uh, the AP-1000, sort of the change in the footprint from their Generation 3 to the Generation 3 Plus. Uh, and, of course, all this comes down to trying to save, uh, save capital dollars. Uh, and... Uh, increases in, in thermal efficiency, and this is sort of due to a lot of the same effects that they've tried to do in the Generation 3 Plus, except, I'm sorry, it's Generation 3, except in Generation 3, they had to do it by backfit, whereas here they can do it by design and put it in at the start, which usually works a little bit better. Oh, rats. Take me back one. Uh, and enabling the 3 Plus improvements, design standardization across these reactors. Uh, the Generation 3 plants, every one of them just about is, is a little bit different. You know, there, there's, there were three PWR vendors at the time in the country, multiple architect engineers, which do the balance of plant, I mean, the turbines and generators and all this. So there's enormous variation between them, and if you standardize, then you tend to learn a lot about improvements, share improvements, and the whole system seems to go better, and they, they seem to have learned that lesson. Uh, modular construction of uh, components in the factory and then assembly in the field, as opposed to all field construction in terms of welding and some big, uh, big concrete pieces. Uh, and a lot of that, uh, uh, and, and there have been efficiency improvements also, and for many of the same reasons I, I listed before in the Generation 3, and the computer-aided design has also enabled this. Now with computers, you can do three-dimensional this and have a whole 3D mock-up of, of your plan in the computer to make sure it will fit and know exact dimensions of all the components you need, which years ago that just wasn't around. Uh, I'll talk more about safety approach uh, uh, and, and the fuels later. A uh, little bit about refueling. Uh, you do some pretty obvious things, like you shut down the reactor, uh, let it cool off some, and then uh, get it below boiling, and then lo lower the pressure to atmospheric. Uh, you put high concentrations of boron in the water to make sure you don't have a criti criticality issue. Uh, you remove the head bolts, and then the pressure vessel head and the control rods. This is a pressure vessel head up here, and the, uh, the, the control rods are, are dangling down here as, as they draw them up. Uh, then you have you remove the upper internals. There's a plate sitting on top of the fuel, and so you can access the fuel assemblies themselves. Uh, then you flood the refueling pool. Um, I think I have a picture of that, so I'll hold that in abeyance. 
uh, and then you begin removing spent fuel and inserting fresh fuel, and that's basically done with more or less a, a, a crane with a, with a hook on it, and the fuel has little handles on, on the top, and you just lift it up and move it out. Uh, and while the refueling is going on, and over on the right you see the uh, looking down into the core and the, the refueling pool, uh, it's not just refueling. You use the opportunity for shutdown to do all sorts of maintenance. It's, a, it's a, just a frantic scramble uh, to get all this done because every day you're not operating is, you know, another million or two of electricity you're, you're not generating. So uh, they've gotten very good at this. Uh, a little bit more about how this goes on. Uh, you see the reactor here and the, the, the head and the um, control rod drives have been removed. And, and normally, this entire area up, up in here is, is dry. It's just a, a big pit, and they, they usually put some kind of a lid here so things don't go into it. But during refueling, after you get the lid off, you, you flood this entire area here up to uh, essentially floor level, and it provides more radiation shielding. But then what you do is you take an assembly out, and you move it over here and set it down, and then this little gizmo turns the assembly on its side, lays it from vertical to horizontal, and it goes through a little tunnel out into the spent fuel pool, which is you know, just a big swimming pool where you're going to store it and let the decay heat go away. And then you get it by the handle and drag it upright and just put it in a rack and there it sits. Um, you'll see later the BWRs are a little <coughs> bit different than that and, and maybe in some, in some important ways. Uh, but that's how refueling basically proceeds with these things. Uh, after refueling, basically, you, you just reverse the process of putting it back together. Uh, the average refueling outage is, is on the neighborhood. Uh, what, what I found was 38 to 42 days. Generation 3 plus reactors are shooting for half of this, uh, trying to get another couple of weeks of operation. Uh, and in each refueling, 20 to 33 percent of the core is replaced during uh, each refueling out outage. Uh, 33 is probably more of a, of a historical number, and now more and more of the reactor is going to be more at, at the 20 percent because they're leaving the fuel in longer and, and burning it up more, so less has to come out. Uh, okay, talk a little bit about some nuclear accidents here. Um, a nuclear reactor is, is very concentrated in, in, a, in a liter, which is what, like a quart, you're generating 50 to 100 kilowatts of thermal power. Uh, that's a fairly amount, a fair amount of uh, energy in a local place, so you've got to keep removing the heat. Even if you shut down the reactor, just scram it, instantaneously you're, you're still generating heat at about a 6% rate, which is a couple hundred megawatts for a large reactor. That ramps away at about 10% per day in, in the short term, which is in, in an accident scenario, you're, you're, you're talking about the short term. Uh, this is sort of a, let me call it a prototypical kind of a reactor accident that, that, uh, that is considered. It's basically someplace the primary coolant loop is breached and coolant water escapes. You know, it, it depressurizes, it flashes to steam. Uh, the reactor is presumed to be scrammed immediately, so you get down to your 6%, but it's still a lot of power. Uh, and at that point, the fuel surface can dry out and begin to heat uh, the surface of the, of the fuel cladding. At about 2200 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take a little bit, the cladding begins to fail, and I in, in zircaloy cladding, zircaloy is uh, pyrophoric, so you get it to a certain temperature, it begins to not, not so much burn with oxygen, but more react with water, and zir zirconium goes to zirconium oxide, with the other product being our delightful friend hydrogen, uh, which I suspect you've heard more than you want about in the last couple of months. Uh, but then if, if that starts to happen, you've breached the cladding, so uh, fission products can get out. You've got a fire kind of a situation going on, which provides a driving force to uh, volatilize and move them around. And even though these are in uh, containment, uh, secondary containments and this kind of thing, if you overpressurize it, radionuclides can and essentially escape. That, that's sort of a, of a rough 
you know, the, the typical concept of a reactor accident. Now, you know, sort of, what do you do about it? Well, the first obvious thing is keep the core wet. I've got a colleague named Lake Barrett who's been active in the uh, Fukushima situation, and he says a wet core is a happy core. And if, if, you, if you keep it wet, uh, and maybe as a corollary, you can get the heat out of the, you know, the, the water that's in there, not real bad things will happen, at least uh, uh, safety or health impact wise. You know, you might mess up your reactor real good, but that's an economic issue. Uh, if not, those things I, I mentioned, uh, cladding breach, cladding fire, fuel melt, and uh, steam explosions, uh, uh, steam slash hydrogen explosions. Uh, rule number two, see rule number one. And what I mean by there is you want to have defense in depth to make sure you can keep the core covered. Not just, you know, one mechanism, but two or three or four. Uh, and rule number three is if you can't do those, you deal with the consequences. Now, believe it or not, this, this slide is uh, at least half a year old, if not a year. So it predates our recent events over in Japan, which I, astounds me. But uh, now, preventing an accident. Uh, you, first, you want to eliminate features that facilitate coolant release. Uh, you'd like not to have pressure uh, uh, penetrations in the pressure vessel low, below the core, because if one of those breaches, no matter how much water you keep pouring in the top, if you got a hole in the bottom of your bucket, you're 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 you're, you're you're in, you're in difficulty already. Uh, and um, make sure you have, uh, I have provisions for active cooling in an accident situation. Secondly, you want to uh, detect solutions. You want to be able to understand that problems are happening before they can lead to a coolant loss and prevent them. And there have been instances you may have read in the papers of like uh, corrosion that haven't gotten to an accident situation, but there's been corrosion in some pressure vessels that has gotten way too far along without being detected. Uh, and the other is, if an accident is, uh, uh, you need to be able to detect coolant loss early and accurately. And in Three Mile Island, you might remember some years ago, and in some of the Japanese reactors, in both cases, uh, they were having a lot of difficulty figuring out exactly what is the water level. Is the core uncovered or is it not? Uh, it's just that kind of information. And that's that detection, which is more instrumentation, needs to be coupled with training solutions, which is understand the reactor in both normal and off-normal situations and when to intervene or not. In the Three Mile Island situation, they had some instrument readings, uh, and they thought they knew what it meant, but it, it meant something else. So the actions they took were actually counterproductive for a while until they figured it out, uh, because actually they hadn't instrumented, you know, something what, what you really want to know, which is like the water level. You know, they had indirect or inferential measurements, uh, and and so those are all fairly important. Uh, now, controlling an accident, going a little bit more into how to do that, uh, you need to supply coolant and sustain it. Coolant and power are essential to doing that. Uh, you can have all the water in the world. If you can't pump it, uh, it's not going to work very well. Uh, power sources, of course, you've got external, which is the, the grid. that The reactors are connected up to the power grid. And they've got emergency diesel generators with diesel supplies, and those are tested regularly. And they also have some amount of batteries in there, but that isn't going to last you for a long time. It can help you with some instrumentation, but running a reactor coolant pump on batteries is, is not a winning proposition. And what you'll see here is it's sort of a schematic of a, of a PWR, and they have multiple react water injection systems. These are borated water, and if you get into trouble and they scram the reactor, the first you've got is a high pressure injection system, which can inject water at, you know, 1,500 or 2,000 PSI right away while the reactor is, is depressurizing. But it can't get much volume in. 
Then as it gets lower down in the hundreds, you've got an intermediate pressure and then a low pressure. And as you go down each, they can move more water in. And uh, the, the water uh, is, any water that gets out of the reactor is collected in a sump which goes back to these, uh, to these pumps so you can keep circulating the water and you, uh, try, you try to get, uh, you have a coolant feature and uh, a cool heat removal feature in there to try to help get the heat out. And this is a generalization. Each, each you know, different reactor designs have variations on this, but this is a, a very typical kind of a thing. Uh, containing the release. Uh, you want to keep releases from the pressure vessel within the building. Now what you've got here is you've got your pressure vessel, 10 inches thick, made to contain 2200 PSI, and presumably we've got a problem that it's, it's, it's leaking water someplace, somehow. Okay, and for pressurized water reactors, then there is, a, is the uh, containment building. And that's, uh, or containment dome, they're not all domes, reinforced concrete, enough volume to handle pressure, uh, and design features to reduce pressure. Uh, and I've listed a few here, and they're not standardized. Uh, but what you want to do is basically, if, if, you're, you're, if you're venting outside of the pressure vessel in the primary loop, you want to try to keep it in this big concrete building so it doesn't get out into the environment and that kind of thing. Uh, and, and so uh, I'll say a little bit more about these uh, con containment buildings. And the, the last resort, if your containment building can't hold it, can't hold what's going into it, which, which means it, it's in danger of being overpressurized, there, are, there is a filtered venting outside. In other words, you open a valve and it goes through a, a, an off-gas processing system to like remove iodine and this kind of thing and then you vent the gas to the outside to alleviate the pressure. Uh, now for a PWR, these are some examples of, of containment buildings. Uh, they're, the, the current designs are passive. This one is basically, you've got, a, you've got the reactor vessel down here. You've got up around here is a steel. That's the, that's the containment. And then there's more or less a shell built around that. And this steel thing is, doesn't have penetrations in it, and if something were to happen, the the uh, and you get a lot of steam in here. You try to condense the steam by natural circulation. Uh, air will come in outside of it and then circulate up, sort of like a flute. Uh, so that's one design. Uh, this is another design inside. Uh, up in the top, you put uh, spray heads, and you have a water source and a pipe. And if steam gets in there, you, you spray cool water to help condense the steam. Again, the object is to keep the pressure within the limits of the uh, containment. And this one is an ice. They maintain at all times, sort of around the walls, big blocks of ice. And if steam release comes, it's circulated up past these blocks of ice, again, the condensation. Uh, one other thing I, I point out here is you, you'll notice, uh, this is sort of cartoonish, but in all these cases, the containment is, is large, right, say relative to the size of the reactor. And I'll come back to that point a little bit later in the BWRs, but it's, it's, a, it's a large volume uh, relative to the size of the reactor. Uh, this is a picture of a, of a containment. Uh, some of them are cylindrical, some of them are dome shaped. Uh, reinforced concrete, pretty standard and expensive, big construction. Yeah, you, you haven't mentioned at all the fact that there's uh, hydrogen uh, reactors, you know, prevent LOCA to, 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 to get rid of the hydrogen. Recombiners. Oh, okay. Okay, I thought you were going a different hydrogen direction. <laughs> okay, uh, the, the question is about hydrogen recombiners and uh, some of the reactors uh, recognizing that hydrogen can be produced. You can catalytically recombine it. You don't need a need a flame, but it's, I mean, I suppose platinum. I don't know what metals they use, but you've got oxygen in the air. You got hydrogen. You run them by each other. You can get rid of the hydrogen and put it back into water. What's well, required on all reactors unless they're inert. I think well, it's a requirement for licensing. Is it? Yes. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Well, it sure is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Maybe not in Japan. What do you think? <laughs> uh, maybe not. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, the Generation 3 Plus, these are the more advanced ones that are just coming on. Uh, for the PWRs, in an accident, the well surrounding the pressure vessel is, is flooded, whereas during normal operation, it, it is not. But there's the capability to flood that. Uh, there's the capability, they designed it so, so as to get uh, passive cooling in the core. They don't need to actively circulate it uh, with pumps, although, you know, they, 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 and they do need special provisions for heat removal there, of course, because even if it circulates itself, it's, it's still warming up. Uh, and you saw the containments, I think they're continuing the, the approach of, uh, of passive operations, the, the natural convection and, and, and this kind of thing, and I suspect moving away from the spray systems. Uh, the Areva design, I don't have as much information on it, but uh, they decided to include a core catcher for melded debris, and the general idea there is if worse comes to worse and your fuel is melding, they put a little device down at the bottom to sort of spread the fuel out and not let it concentrate in one place. Uh, and U.S. designs don't have that. The French seem to think it's a good idea. I, I can't parse all that. Uh, but their design doesn't have passive cooling, so uh, that's about what I know about their design. Now, Thinking back, I know it would be nice to have actual measurements of these things when they do happen, also for the force more forward <laughs> analysis of what happened through the whole thing, not just to find out what's happening in real time, but to be able to measure things when you can't get to it. It's, you know, like, do you think it'll have an effect on these gen? I think that the, 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 I'll summarize the question is, uh, I, well, we'll, we'll Fukushima have an effect on instrumentation and monitoring in the Gen 3 Plus, which are the ones that are being built, and I'll extend that a little bit to the to the Gen 3. Uh, I think the the NRC last week came out with their initial digest of uh, what should be done at U.S. reactors in response to Japan, and for the existing reactors, uh, monitoring and instrumentation is is squarely on the table. Now, what the commission will decide to do at what pace, uh, actually there's a meeting today on that, I think. Uh, the, what we heard last week was the staff recommendation to the commission, and today the commission is holding a public meeting to discuss amongst themselves which of all those recommendations they will undertake on, on what kind of a schedule. And, uh, you know, at this point, industry is sort of, you know, let's make sure we understand what we're doing before we ch charge off. And uh, at least the chairman of the NRC seems to be maybe a little bit more inclined to charge off. So we'll see how it turns out. He's he's, he's got to get votes <laughs> to do something. Uh, now, in in the uh, with respect to the three plus, the ones that are going in now, I'm a I don't know enough detail on those to know how much instrumentation they have as a compared to the Generation 3. Uh, I think it's, I'll, I'll talk about uh, Fukushima a little bit more specifically here when I, when I get through BWRs in, in, in general, but it, it, it's pretty clear that the reactor operators were really struggling to figure out what the heck was going on in there. Uh, so they didn't have enough. Now whether what they have is what we have now and, and what's in new designs, whether we have more to start with, that's still in the unknown pile. Uh, well, you know, one, one thing with that, I don't know if the Japanese had to do it, but after Fremont Island, we had this whole Red Guy 197, New Red 0737, where they had to put a whole lot more instrumentation in, so we did know. Well, it, it, so I, I don't know if the Japanese had to, had to do that with their GE design. I they haven't gotten far enough down the road. Well, certainly they, they haven't done it yet, uh, and I'm not aware that the Japanese regulator has said that they have to do it yet, but they're certainly looking at that. Uh, and I mean, right now they're, 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 they're struggling. They got some reactors that are 
more stable every day, but still a mess. And maybe more importantly, they've got the aftermath of an earthquake, which nationwide had had the much greater impact. And so they're working through it a sort of a step at a time. And it'll be going on for a long time. A boiling water reactor, and, and I'm to a little bit approach this by, by difference with a PWR uh, because there's a lot of similar features. But basically what, what you've got is, again, your pressure vessel, uh, and the, the water comes in uh, and in that circulates down to the bottom and goes up through. And the difference here is the reactor is operated at a pressure on the order of 1,200 PSI, give or take a little bit. And at that pressure, when you get half, thir two thirds of the way up, the water boils. And so uh, you're making steam inside the reactor vessel. And there's other things up here I'll talk about in uh, a little bit uh, later when I got some better exhibits. But uh, the, the water circulates out and it goes through your turbine and whatever and condenser and then comes back in. Uh, and what, what that means uh, is uh, you're, you're taking reactor from the core and running it through your turbine system, so there's some degree of, of radioactivity out there from the corrosion products and all this other junk where, as in the PWR, that's fairly clean water that goes through the turbine, which is sort of a downside. Uh, you take a bit of a temperature hit uh, because of the lower pressure, but on the other hand, you don't have the inefficiencies of the secondary loop. So on balance, you know, they, they end up about, with about the same thermal efficiency and our U.S. fleet's about two-thirds PWR and one-third BWR. Oh, there's anything else. Let's see. Uh, talked about the first one. Now, what's probably obvious when you think about it is if you're boiling in there, you can't have any boric acid because if you boil, the boric acid is a solid powder and it's gonna plate out over everything and you wouldn't operate for a day. So this reactor is controlled with uh, control rods. Uh, and, and to some extent, you can control it a little bit with uh, pumping. Well, the control rods are boron carbide, which is a, a solid material. By controlling it by pumping, uh, what I mean by that is, if you slow down the pumping and, and moving the coolant through, you're still generating heat, you get more steam, which means more void space, less moderation, so power tends to drop back down. And conversely, if you pump it faster, you tend to get a little bit uh, less void space and uh, a little bit more moderation. So you, you can maneuver w within that, but uh, the control rods are it. Uh, in contrast to PWRs, uh, the BWR had one vendor for many, many years, which was General Electric. Uh, General Electric's now, I don't know whether they're owned by, associated by, I don't understand all the corporate stuff, but Mitsubishi and uh, Toshiba. Uh, let's see, but the designs we have right now in terms of what's deployed are fairly standard, and they, and they went through sort of a steady, steady evolution of reactor designs from BWR1 to 6 and containment vessels, uh, containment designs from Mark 1 to Mark 3. And uh, the, the reactor is uh, pretty much, you, you, you've got your core. Uh, the control rods come in the bottom on this and they have to do, well, let me start the other way around. Up at the top, the mixture of steam and water droplets comes off and you've got a steam separator and a steam dryer and then the, the, the steam is taken off and it, it goes to the turbine of course and the water drops back down and there's a sort of an internal you see a, a recirculation pump that, that that moves the water uh, sort of pulls it on down and circulates it back up in addition to the to the feed water coming back in from the turbine so you've got this uh, external, little external loop down here. They aren't huge pipes, but they are external. They are low on the, uh, uh, on the pressure vessel. And uh, your, of course, your reactor core. And because you've got all this junk up here, the control rods have to come in from the bottom. And that's, uh, that's pretty standard. Well, it, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, steam separator. The vessel's a bit taller because you've got all this, all this other stuff up here. Uh, and the pressure is lower. Uh, I guess I said most of that. Uh, this is a little bit of a cartoon. 
uh, gives you a little bit more of a flavor of it, and I don't think I don't think it adds a lot new, so we'll keep motoring. Uh, just some pictures of it. This is the uh, the core ba uh, core basket, and each one of those little squares would contain a fuel assembly, and the top view of the core. Whoops. Uh, and this is the refueling floor, which is sort of up at this level. And during normal operation, you've got this, this plate over this big well. And you see here the, the vessel head being removed in the uh, refueling pool. And it'll be lift up and sort of set aside as you go through refueling. Now, uh, BWR safety systems, these are, uh, uh, we've got the three marks. And in Japan, the reactors that had trouble are all Mark Ones, and so you've got your pressure vessel right here, uh, and uh, sort of a, a, a lid over that. And this light bulb-shaped gizmo is the primary containment, not not the pressure vessel, but the primary containment. It's made out of reinforced concrete and fun stuff like that, uh, and. This, the Mark II design, is, is sort of similar. You see the primary containment, uh, but this one, uh, well, let me describe how this one would work. If you get into trouble and you, have, you, know, you start releasing water from the pressure vessel, you start to pressurize this primary containment. If that gets too high, the, the uh, steam air mixture gets, I'll call it, blown down into this thing, which is a torus. I'll have a picture of it in a second that'll give you better idea. But it grows from this dry well down into the torus that's like a suppression pool. There's bubblers and the steam is, is bubbled, uh, released underneath the surface of the water and bubbles up to condense it. And then, well, uh, let me leave uh, any more detail. These other two are similar to that. Uh, the, the steam would come down and, and, and you see these uh, the, from three down to five, those are the bubblers there. And this one, the, the gases would come over, and there's sort of an over-under kind of a thing and be bubbled up through this pool, which is an annulus around the uh, pressure vessel. Now, th this cartoon shows things a, a little bit more clearly. Uh, th this is a, sort of a 3D rendition, and you can see those little legs coming down in the torus, and it's like a big donut. And this whole thing looks like a, a big light bulb. I uh, wanted to maybe point out a couple of things here. Uh, one thing is this primary containment is relatively small compared to the size of the pressure vessel. You remember I mentioned the P, uh, PWR, the primary containment is this big thing. And in the BWRs, this big building uh, is, is not a, a, a pressure containment building. I mean, it keeps the weather out and, and has some degree of integrity, but it's not made to handle any degree, uh, any substantial degree of overpressure. And that's why over in Japan you see those, oh, let me surprise you with them. Uh, the other thing I want to notice is this is sort of where you do re refueling up, up in here. And when you refuel, you, you, you lift this lid off and you take the head off the, uh, the pressure vessel, you set it aside. And you start taking fuel out and putting fuel in, but the fuel storage pool is over here. It is very close to the reactor, and it's fairly high up. And and, uh, uh, and so and well and and there's a gate from this area over here that can be open or closed. And normally during refueling, you you flood it up to the floor level here, and then you open the gate and you take assemblies out and put them here and the fresh fuel is stored over here and you move it back in and, and then reverse the process. So those are what I think are significant differences uh, on the BWRs. Now this is uh, Brown's Ferry, uh, a, a picture of, uh, of the Taurus, the vessel head, and, and the reactor pressure, pressure vessel. doesn't have the uh, containment built yet. Uh, now let's talk about Fukumish. Fukushima, easy for me to say. Uh, and I'll set a little bit of background and then what I think we know. Uh, and I predict you'll, at the end you'll find it unsatisfying, but okay. Uh, initial, uh, and there's the Fukushima Daiichi 
which are the six reactors where they had real trouble. And then there was another, I think it's a four pack called Dyene, which is a little bit further to the north that did not get in trouble. But there were six reactors at Daiichi. Uh, all but unit four were operating when events transpired. Unit four had been shut down for repair. Uh, it had been uh, defueled, meaning all the fuel had been removed from the core and put in the spent fuel pool. And uh, apparently, this vintage BWRs, they were having problems with the, uh, what I call the core barrel, the shroud, the big thing uh, around the fuel. And they were removing that. They were cutting it up in pieces and, and hauling it out and going to replace it. And so that's why they offloaded the whole thing and it was shut down. Uh, the event uh, on the March 11, mid-afternoon Japan time, they had a 9.0 offshore quake. That, some say 9.3, whatever. It's, it's in that uh, ballpark. Design basis was an 8.2, but because this is a logarithmic scale, that's about a 6x difference. Uh, it's not as trivial as it looks comparing 8.2 to 9. Uh, and then, oh, roughly an hour later, a 14-meter tsunami came ashore. Uh, the design basis was 5.7 meters, and uh, the reactor and equipment were 10 to 13 above sea level. Um, so what did that lead to? Uh, the, f the first thing that happened is the earthquake itself basically caused the electrical grid to go down. I mean, all, all over the country, uh, you know, wires came down, switch stations went away, so they lost their external source of electricity. Uh, and then the second thing is the tidal wave came, or the tsunami came in uh, and came up and actually ran in between the turbine buildings and the reactor buildings. In most of these, the diesel generators, number one, were at a relatively low elevation, so they got inundated by seawater. Uh, secondly, with that, it probably didn't make any difference, but the, uh, the tsunami also uh, washed away some of their diesel oil supplies. So uh, after the electricity was lost, the external, the diesel started normally, but then they had a limited fuel supply, but then they got flooded out. So they basically had some batteries left. And so you've got this, this thing, uh, you can't, uh, you have no electricity to circulate cooling water and you have no instruments. The, the batteries don't last an awful long time. They did last a day or so. Uh, and you've got a real mess on your hands, so the reactors proceeded to do bad things. Uh, and with, with the loss of coolant, eventually the core heated up, heated up. It started to overpressurize, and, and the reactor operators saw this, and so at some point, they have to make a decision. Uh, and, and they don't want the pressure vessel to just rupture. So they make a deliberate decision to start venting it out here in, into the dry well. And the venting uh, gets to, at the start, it's steam. But as it, if the water level gets down, then you get a mixture of hydrogen and steam. And the problem you get there is, of course, hydrogen and any other gases uh, other than steam, but most of them, most of the other ones, are not condensable. In other words, you can run it through a suppression pool, but you're not going to condense hydrogen. Uh, but anyway, they, they released it out to the primary uh, containment, and that continued to pressurize, so they eventually started blowing down into the torus. Now, what, uh, you know, and, and, and then the last resort, of course, is this, this vent line that's uh, supposed to be filtered and released outside the building. Now, for, let me, uh, let me keep on going, and this is a little bit more stepwise about the, you know, the uh, cl some cladding bursting and then oxidizing hydrogen release, partial melting, primary overpressure, and, and venting down. This goes through uh, uh, pretty much what I've just talked about, uh, and, and then the, the, this vent to the secondary containment. This vent to the secondary containment is part of what I don't understand yet. Because in theory, the venting, as you saw in that previous diagram, should go through from the torus through what's supposed to be a hardened vent system, hardened meaning it should withstand this kind of stuff through the filters and outside. It's pretty clear 
that the venting occurred into the secondary containment, you know, this, this big building, releasing steam, hydrogen, fission products at some point. Now, you know, was the vent system not hardened and failed? Was the vent system okay, but a valve didn't get opened to operate, or they couldn't open the valve? Another possibility is the earthquake cracked the primary containment vessel and uh, or the seals around it, and so the overpressure in here it just kept leaking up into the secondary, but they leaked enough hydrogen, some ignition source, so eventually after that, uh, units one, two, and three all had what are, are fairly firmly believed to be hydrogen explosions. Uh, there's, uh, in, in the course of trying to keep these reactors cool, the, the Japanese operators uh, started circulating seawater through them, which means the, I mean, the reactors are, are shot, even if they weren't before, but they made a deliberate decision to take the, uh, do that. Uh, but uh, I, I've seen some anecdotal accounts that maybe they waited a bit too long to do that. But again, uh, they were having troubles with instrumentation and figuring out where the water level was or not. Is the core uncovered or not? So that was the situation in, in units one, two, and three. They blew up, and, and you can see here, uh, you know, the, the secondary containment's blowing up, but it's not a real strong structure. You know, it's, you, you can see, you know, a, uh, uh, steel, uh, steel kind of a, uh, uh, framework, and, and, and then, you know, there's, there's um, metal paneling on it, but it's not like it's a reinforced concrete anything. So. Not, not, not in the sense you'd mean it. It's not, it's not meant to contain pressure. Yeah. It, it's more meant to, you know, protect everything from the outside. Right. Right. Uh, and and so th those three uh, blew up uh, and were melting, uh, and they've got fission products, very radioactive inside in in, in many places. Uh, now, I want to talk a little bit about Unit 4. I, I guess maybe I should say Units 5 and 6 came through relatively unscathed. They were uh, high enough off the ground, uh, high enough up, that they, they uh, didn't get their local supply, the uh, generators didn't get compromised. So th they did okay. Uh, now, Unit 4, remember, that's defueled. It wasn't operating, so they got a whole different problem. Uh, at this point, the refueling pool was, was flooded and they were working in there. Uh, this says the gate status is unknown. I, I, I learned last week in a, in a report the Japanese sent to the IAEA, they, they say that the gate was open. Uh, and, and they were w moving things back and forth and trying to get the, the core shroud and whatever out. Uh, and explosions occurred in the secondary containment and blew the top and side out of Unit 4. Uh, happened fairly soon on. That leads to the question of, if it's not operating, what the heck blew up? What, what exploded, e exactly. The, the first supposition very, uh, let me uh, move on here. Okay. The first thought was that it was due to low water levels in the pool, that the spent fuel storage pool was leaking someplace, the fuel had come uncovered, the, the, the fuel pool was crammed, had some I mean, a whole core of very, not very old fuel, that the water level gone out, down, you start to oxidize fuel and cladding burst, the same thing that happened in the core of the others, just a bit more slowly. Uh, and that the hydrogen had been evolved and, and, went, and it went bang. Okay. Uh, and that persisted for some number of weeks, but then they got, uh, they did a couple of things. First, they got a submersible device, a remotely controlled, and they sent it tooling around the, the fuel pool uh, there's a lot of, I have a little two minute video someplace uh, and uh, I saw that and the first re immediate reaction was no there's no melting here you could see the top of the assemblies it looked very good in the pool the pool was fairly clear you could see 30 40 50 feet um, and what you could see on top of the fuel assemblies there was some debris but of course the building exploded above it so junk dropped down and then they got a water sample out of it that showed much lower concentrations of fission products than you would expect if there'd been any fuel rupture. So that's gotten us to scratching our heads. Uh, and I say me, but you know everybody around. Uh, 
th there was one theory that maybe up in that refueling cavity, which is very high up, that they might have stored some spent fuel in there, which had less water above it, and maybe that came down and melted and hydrogen exploded. Uh, also, this uh, core barrel they're taking out is, is physically very large, but it's got a lot of hollow space, so they had a, a, acetylene cylinders around to cut it up using, using in torches, and maybe acetylene cylinders went off. The most recent theory from the Japanese is that the hydrogen explosion, that it was a hydrogen explosion, but the hydrogen came from Unit 3 because the ventilation ductwork, <coughs> excuse me, ductwork from secondary containment Unit comes for unit three and four comes together, and, you know they you know sort of comes in and do a Y and heads on out and goes to the site stack, uh, and that is their current theory. Which I don't know of anything to refute it so far, but they they don't know that for sure either. But that's where they are on this right now. Uh, other than that, on the site, uh, we we believe there has been problems or have been problems in the units one through three spent fuel pools with losing some water and coming uncovered and, and overheating. But that's not certain because inside of those reactors, it's, it's very radioactive and they, and they just haven't been able to get there yet and do the inspections. They've had some remote pictures of it, but you look at a pool, it, it looks like a junkyard or something. You just can't see anything. So exactly what happened there uh, remains a uh, remains unknown. They did have both a common spent fuel pool and dry storage on the site, both of which came through essentially unscathed. Uh, I certainly would have expected it for dry and, and the pool didn't have any problems either. Uh, they've had to shore up the Unit 4 pool from beneath a little bit because of some cracking provide support. But, uh, but and. Uh, so they're managing the situation is basically they, they poured water into reactor buildings. You, you saw the long reach fire hoses and, and a lot of that was uh, uh, at the first just seawater and eventually they were able to switch over to borated fresh water. But they poured a lot of it in there which led then to a water management problem. If you keep pouring the water in, of course the water dissolves fission products so you got contaminated water. and. Uh, uh, some of it leaked out into the ocean, but eventually they ended up with a water management problem. The sumps and the basements just kept filling up. They didn't want to release it because of the radioactivity, but they had no other place to put it. Uh, so uh, eventually they took some of the lowest uh, concentrations and, and did release that to the ocean. And with time, they got some portable tankage, and now they're putting in uh, water processing where you run it through ion exchange and get mainly the cesium is the problem, get the cesium out. Uh, they did after a bit, they were able to in inert the primary containment uh, to stop the um, cladding oxidation issue. Uh, and then they got site power restored uh, and the re restored the power inside the reactors for instrumentation and other things. Uh, and they're, they're about at the point they've contained, uh, restored closed loop cool, cooling every place, but they still got to, this timeline now starts to really stretch out. They got to contain the gaseous releases and with cracks or whatever, that will be a challenge. Uh, they've hired, I think it's the Ariba, somebody to come in and process all the contaminated water in the sumps. Uh, and then D&D &D is going to take uh, years and exactly what D&D &D means in this case is, is not clear. Are they going to tear them down and tomb them? A sacrifice zone for, forever? I, it's, it's just not known. Uh, still much more unknown than is known about, about the extent of damage, exactly what was done inside each of the reactors and was that a good thing or, or was that a bad thing? Uh, Firm knowledge is, is likely to take a, a, a couple of years. Uh, and th this, this long time frame is, is, is unsatisfying to a, a lot of people in, in, in Washington and elsewhere who would like more, more immediate answers. But uh, I, I mentioned Lake Barrett this before, who was 
a manager in the TMI recovery and is now finding uh, yeoman service in advising on Fukushima. And he, he calls this the accident fog. It's just, that, you know, the Japanese are, are too busy just trying to stabilize the thing and make sure, you know, it, it doesn't come back to bite them. And they're not in the, in the mode of, of investigations and exactly what's in there as long as it doesn't come back to bite them for the time being. Uh, and it took two years to get into Three Mile Island, and over there we've got three to four reactors that, that, that are compromised. Uh, and, of course, we've got a, a, a language and a culture barrier over there. So uh, it's going to be a while before we know all this. Uh, there's still fairly high radiation levels inside the units and at the site boundary. Uh, water processing should help this because the, in most places the problem is, is cesium, and, and which is fairly soluble. Uh, but they're, they're working at that and they're making inroads to get inside. Uh, you see occasional videos and they have little robotic gizmos going around inside the reactor, but they're not terribly instructive. It just sort of rolls by bunches of you know, pipes and pumps and instruments and uh, that kind of thing. Sir. I don't know if you mentioned it or if you did, I missed it. Did the, when after the earthquake occurred, did they did they did the reactors scram on their own? Did they shut them down? Did they? Did that, didn't say. The, the the reactors the reactors shut down immediately. I don't remember whether they were manually shut down or automatically shut down. I, I'm going to guess probably automatic because they lost their electricity outlet and and you know that that happens real quick uh, and and I'm gonna guess that they, they, they did get shut down so it, there there was no ongoing criticality but uh, I guess I never the, the report indicates that they shut down automatically based on size uh, yeah. okay the seismometers okay okay so it was very immediate then um, that's all I had on our folks in Japan, and uh, it's just going to be a, a story. It's going to one step at a time, and we'll, we'll have to see what the implications are in the U.S. Uh, here, oh, it's been a couple of months now. I had a chance to, uh, I and some others, sit down with a, a, a senior uh, technical person from General Electric, U U.S. General Electric, and at this point, they do not have, and I think people in the U.S. do not have, as-built drawings for those reactors. So in the case of the U.S. for the Mark I containments and that vintage, over the years there were a series of improvements made in them in terms of the, the downcomers into the Taurus and the vent system and, uh, and other um, emergency features. Uh, you know, by N NRC direction, and those were have, have been done over here for a long time. We don't know whether the Japanese did those or not. We don't know how well they did them. It's just that, that's all in the fog and, and to be determined. Uh, t you know, if, if they did a lot of that and then got to where they are, it maybe will put more pressure in the U.S. If they hadn't done all of these, uh, maybe less. We'll we'll see. In your opinion, what would be the difference if, uh, from in this accident scenario had these been PWR rather than BWR? I don't know this, but I would like to think that the larger volume of the PWR primary containment, that big concrete building, with its larger volume would have been better able to absorb the pressure. Uh, and secondly, if you would have had some releases, instead of being released to a secondary containment that isn't much containment, it would be released to a, a pressure, uh, you know, the primary containment, which is a real containment and contain, you know, some degree of not only pressure, but radionuclides. So I don't know that. You know, I'm not that far into the analysis, uh, but I would hope that would have been the case, but I don't know. Uh, generation 3 Plus. Uh, there's the two now GE co companies with uh, 
and as far as I can tell, the, the Japanese outfits are the, the dominant part of these relationships. Uh, they've, uh, again, gone on to 3+, plus, a, a lot the same as the PWRs, and efficiency increases. Uh, they've tried to uh, uh, internalize these recirculation pumps that I mentioned hung off the outside of the Generation 3, uh, and, uh, and they, they claim no penetrations on the lower part of the vessel. Now, in, in the next slide or so, I'll maybe quibble with that. And then fine motion control rods. Uh, remember, these guys, uh, a a BWR starts up and shuts down using uh, control rods. And in the earlier designs, it, it's sort of a ratchet kind of a thing. And the ratchet was too coarse. So they would move it, you know, one, one click, and all of a sudden they get a bump in reactivity in the reactor, and it would go a little bit more than they wanted. So they made the clicks smaller, or finer gears, I guess is the best way to say it. Uh, and the uh, extremely safe BWR, uh, again, the thermal efficiency, a, a notable th feature here is they have natural circulation during operation. Most of these have natural circulation during accidents and, and uh, pump cooling uh, in, in the primary. Th this is designed to have natural circulation, uh, gravity flooding in an accident, and passive containment. Most of the rest of the improvements, I mean, in terms of l less equipment and margins and all this other stuff I mentioned for PWRs, they're, they're doing the same thing. It's, uh, and this is the uh, ABWR, and uh, this is what I mean. Uh, these are the, uh, uh, the re recirculation pumps, and well, it, it's not a pipe, but it still looks like a penetration in a pressure vessel to me, so uh, I'm, I'm slightly skeptical of that. But, all the rest of it is is fairly much the same, and uh, ESBWR, of course, they, they don't need the recirculation pumps because it's natural. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of amazed this reactor works, but it's far enough along in design and whatever that i got to believe it does. Uh, so uh, what have we got here? Uh, I'm not going to go through these, uh, at least not at this point, and I'd like to uh, bring up the next presentation, whatever that